Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are going to kick off this afternoon's session of council with a proclamation recognizing our very good friend uh, Kenny Reichert for his years of service to the residents of Montgomery County and Maryland uh, by his service and support of our dear friend Ben, Senator Cardin. So uh, this will be led by Council Vice President Friedson and myself. Thank you, Mr. President. I am so excited to be here to recognize our dear friend, Ken Reichert, who has been in front of this body, who has been working alongside this body, who has been out and about all around Montgomery County and throughout our state as really a testament to what public service can and should be. Uh, a gentleman, uh, a soft-spoken person with deeply held beliefs and values who has really understood the meaning of service and how to use government as a tool to improve people's lives and has dedicated and committed himself to serving the residents of Montgomery County, the residents of our state, and who has worked alongside our friend Ben, uh, Senator Cardin, uh, for many years, who uh, came up through the labor movement and was a great leader uh, within the labor movement and who has been really at the forefront of so many of the public policy discussions and just as importantly if not more importantly so many of the everyday challenges that our residents are facing so often the role of a legislator isn't necessarily to write laws first it's to solve problems and it has been Ken Reichard, on behalf of Senator Cardin, who really is at the forefront of solving those problems for residents on a day-to-day -day basis. So really honored to be here, to be able to recognize his illustrious career, multiple decades of service to our community. Really thrilled that he has family here with him today and a number of important colleagues who are really uh, proud and, and excited uh, to be here uh, with him uh, as well, who are part of that legacy of service and uh, of uh, serving the county residents uh, that we all care so deeply about. So with that, let me turn it over to Council President Glass, and then we'll turn it over uh, to Ken Reichert. So uh, Vice President Friedson said, you know, our friend Ben, but I like to think our friend Ken, right? We need a lawn sign with that thing. Um, but uh, when I first met Ken a uh, number of years ago, uh, he was clearly in the service of, of Senator Cardin. Uh, but as a lifelong Montgomery County resident, uh, he knows this place inside and out. And those are the skills that uh, Senator Cardin needed, that we all needed, uh, because as Ken has shared with me on a number of occasions, Montgomery County is an interesting place. Uh, and it, it takes a know-how, uh, and it takes some ingenuity to help maneuver. And you know, we are the most diverse, diverse place in Maryland, um, and it takes creativity, dedication, um, and genuine public service to fit all the pieces together to serve all of our residents. Um, and that is on display at the council here today. Uh, maybe if we come back later at, at 8 o'clock, we still might be here. Um, but you are now retired, so you are not obligated to be here. Um, but from your work at UFCW, your work with Senator Cardin, uh, and your lifelong com commitment to Montgomery County, we are all better for you, uh, because of you, and grateful to you. So thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. It, it's really a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank everybody, the council, and all of my colleagues that I've worked with for several decades here. Uh, I'm not going to get the name and names, but uh, it's very important that you recognize the people that you work with and the people that help make you be successful. And the county has some excellent staff people that I had the opportunity to work with. The council has some excellent staff people, and because of of people it's like a team together and because of that team is so good you're able to do some good things for the county and good things for the citizens of maryland um i worked for the, for paris glenn denning for the eight years that he was in office so i've had the opportunity of working for the labor movement 
working for the uh, city uh, of the um, Maryland state government and also the federal government. And I, I, each one of them is a little different, and each one of them has its own gratification, and I've had a lot of gratification over the years. But working with the council, because I live here in Rockville, it, it really meant more things to me because it was very close to my heart. And I really do appreciate the council and, and what they do for the citizens of Montgomery County and, of course, the staff who makes everybody look good. Thank you, and thanks for coming. What I appreciate most about Ken is not him asking about a policy position that the council is taking up a particular issue. Uh, Ken is one of the only people who every time I see him, he says, how's your family? How's mom doing? How, how are mom and dad? How, how's everybody uh, doing uh, on a personal level? And that's the type of human being uh, that he is and what makes me care so deeply about him because I know he cares so deeply about each and every one of us who he has worked with. Uh, over so many years. So we're here today not just to celebrate the positions he has held, but really the person that he is, the humility uh, and the passion uh, that he has for the work that he has done uh, over so many decades. So now uh, Council President Glass and I are going to read a proclamation in his honor. Uh, the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland. Proclamation. Whereas for nearly two decades, Ken Reichard has served our nation, state, and country with, and county with great honor and distinction. His humble heart, keen wit, leadership, loyalty, and dedication to helping others produced an impeccable track record of public service, which has improved the lives of countless residents and their families. And whereas a lifelong resident of Montgomery County, born and only, who attended Richard Montgomery High School, Ken worked part-time at the Safeway Grocery Store on Bradley Boulevard and joined the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. And whereas upon his graduation from high school, Ken began a career of public service and served as a longtime labor leader dedicated to working families. At just 23 years of age, he was elected as the youngest business agent for the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. Ken's work soon extended across the state as executive assistant to the president and director of government affairs and senior vice president, and later as assistant secretary and Commissioner of Labor and Industry at the Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation under former Governor Paris Glendening. Ken has also received numerous awards of gratitude from former Montgomery County Executives Doug Duncan and Sidney Kramer and... Whereas due to his extensive knowledge of the politics and people of Montgomery County and the metropolitan Washington area, Ken became Senator Ben Cardin's Washington area representative in 2006 and served the senator and the people of Montgomery County for more than 17 years, working diligently as a public representative and liaison to organized labor, serving as a trusted and reliable liaison to the state and county elected officials and assisting constituents and business owners with compassionate leadership, proficiency, and humility. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby honors the lifetime service of our friend Ken, Kenneth Paul Reichard, for his unwavering commitment to Montgomery County residents and whose vision has enriched our county, state, and nation in immeasurable ways. Presented on this 18th day of July in the year 2023 by myself, Council Vice President, and Evan Glass, Council, Pre uh, Council President. Congratulations. Thank you. We're going to ask colleagues to come down to take a picture, and then we're going to invite up his grandson and his colleagues uh, as well to take a few pictures.
Okay, thank you very much again, uh, Kenny, for all of your service. And as, as was alluded to, uh, not only is it wonderful to have Kenny here, but his colleagues uh, with our other federal representatives are all here as well. Uh, his successor with Senator Cardin's office, Senator Van Hollen's office, uh, Senator uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin's office as well. Uh, and so, so an honor for all of you to be here and celebrating our friend Ken. So thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to the consent calendar, colleagues. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke. Seconded by Councilmember Katz. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. So this afternoon we are pleased to have with us Dr. Patrice McGee and our Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Madalino, um, who are here for Dr. McGee's interview to be the Chief of Aging and Disability Service services within the Department of Health and Human Services, and we are joined by the Director of Health and Human Services as well. Good to see you, Director Bridgers. I'll turn it over to CEO Madalena. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the Council. Um, I, it's not too often I get introduced and someone cries immediately, but I, I appreciate that opportunity. I know. <laughs> Um, I am pleased to be here to uh, present the nominee from the County Executive for the Chief of Aging Disability Services, Dr. Patricia McGee. Uh, Dr. McGee has been with the uh, County for almost three years, leading our um, uh, area agency on aging. Um, so she has been um, uh, an important leader within this division um, over that time frame. She also comes to us from a career of in social services in the state of Kentucky. Um, a Kentucky native, Louisville graduate, or Louisville, I, don't, I know I don't necessarily say that correctly for you, but Louisville. 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 Yeah. Louisville, okay, sorry. Um, so she has, um, she has served in a variety of capacities um, within the government and the nonprofit sector. She has experience with um, people with disabilities, and um, clearly, when we were interviewing for this position, she was by far um, the best candidate for this position. She's made an impact on the county already. You will hear, if you have not worked with her, I'm sure during the next few minutes of the interview, you will hear her passion for this topic, and I think she will be an excellent addition to the leadership within the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you uh, for that. Dr. Bridgers, do you have anything you want to add? Sure, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Council President and Council colleagues. When I think of Dr. McGee, I think of a servant leader. The, philo the philosophy of a servant leader is to promote, empower, and ensure the well-being of others. And when we talk about social determinants of health and inequities that are across the aging and disability space, she epitomizes that work. And so I'm delighted to sit with her uh, and Mr. Madalino and support the county executive's nomination and I'm sure you are uh, in for a delightful conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, let's begin that conversation. Uh, Dr. McGee, good to see you. Um, if you could please describe your education and background and experience as it relates to being the chief of aging and disability services and turn the microphone on in front of you. You'll get used to it. <laughs> So first, thank you, uh, Mr. Madalino and Dr. Bridges for your, your warm introduction and comments. Thank you, uh, County Council, for this opportunity this morning to sit with you and discuss um, this, the, the topic that's near and dear to my heart and have this dialogue, so thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Council President Glass, for your question. Happy to share. So, I've built my career in public service. I've worked in service areas across health and human services to include transportation, housing, um, mental health, community mental health, uh, early childhood, aging, Medicaid. Um, I've led management staff as they implement federal, state, local funded programs. I've helped streamline infrastructures by modifying and fine tuning policies and procedures uh, within our programs. I've defined uh, advancement strategies 
set departmental goals and objectives, and turn that into action items. It's important to understand how I got here. <laughs> I have a lived experience, and I assure you I've been given permission to share said lived experience. Uh, my mother um, experienced a traumatic health event, uh, which required extensive rehabilitation. And as many adult children, I took up the charge of becoming her primary caregiver. It was day in and day out of doctor's appointments and rehab. It was, as you may imagine, it reshaped our relationship. I'm happy to say that she returned to work and she was able to retire from her career. Uh, about a week before she was cleared from physical therapy, I received a call from the Area Agency on Aging in Louisville, Kentucky, my hometown, um, asking me to interview and then shortly thereafter I was seated uh, to uh, lead their caregiver programs. How timely. There's where I grew my passion for aging. I became dedicated to the work. I learned all about the Older American Act and how its programs are intended to help persons age in place and give them some sense of independence to thrive in their choice of where they of where they uh, were to age in place. I fell in love so much with the programming that I pursued my doctorate of public administration to, to deepen um, my ability to lead in this space. I have turned, uh, obtained my doctorate in 2015 and I went on to serve in a political appointment in the Bashir administration where I uh, led bringing um, the early intervention system back into the cabinet. That was a heavy lift, um, but it, it, it taught me all about intellectual and developmental disabilities in children. From there, I moved into the Medicaid space and really got a deep understanding. <laughs> Council Member Lukey is, is nodding. <laughs> got a really deep understanding of the Medicaid system and how individuals are able to um, access services through that system. So really uh, honed my, my experience there. For the last two and a half years, I've served as the Area Agency on Aging Director here in Montgomery County, where I've really had an opportunity to um, immerse myself in this community and understand how the uh, programs are, in, are, are innovative and operating in, the, in this county. I've been committed to strengthening program processes and enriching the customer experience here been able to reduce barriers that create service access and drive change by focusing on improving uh, data and transforming that data into actionable insights to drive program operations. As Dr. Bridger stated, I truly believe I'm a servant leader. I believe that it is my job to mitigate barriers for staff in order for them to do their jobs efficiently. I believe I am purposed to help others and to help them thrive and live their best lives. I am decisive as well as pragmatic. I value and prioritize staff. I do not make decisions in the silo. I believe in hearing their voices. And listen, if you have not had an opportunity to meet the staff over at Aging and Disability Services, they are some of the hardest working, most dedicated, passionate professionals that I've had the privilege of working with, and I'm thankful that they've, enabled, that they've allowed me to lead in this capacity. I'm excited to continue my service in Montgomery County and lead a and into its next chapter. Fantastic. Uh, lovely introduction. Thank you. Uh, next question I have for you is, what do you see as the most important issue facing seniors and those uh, in the disability community? Uh, and as uh, Chief of Aging and Disability Services, what would be some of your immediate and long-term proposals? Um, so first I want to um, thank the County Executive for entrusting me with this nomination. I had an opportunity to speak with him about this very, <laughs> this very topic, so I thank you for your question, Council President Glass. So there are many, many issues that I could highlight, <laughs> as we all know. Transportation, APS, um, access uh, or needs for vulnerable adults, um, respite services, home and community-based services, labor shortages on and on. Um, but in the interest of time, <laughs> I decided that I would focus on uh, affordable housing as it 
as it really impacts both groups. Um, and I'll highlight that in, in a few more. So nationwide, we know that there's a shift. There's more older adults than there are kids. Um, I heard a stat that half of the five-year-olds today will live to be 100. So we are not only aging, we're living longer. So with that, my, uh, in Montgomery County, I, it is a microcosm of, of, that, of the nation. It is, we are expecting a 36% growth in our older adult population uh, between now and 2040 which is going to make us 50% greater 60 plus in this county. Also, according to county stat, the community level scorecard, 34% uh, of respondents, 65 plus reported housing as a burden, 15% um, have multiple disabilities and 23% live alone. Well, affordable housing can be burdensome from anyone, but especially older adults that are on fixed incomes and persons with disabilities that are on fixed incomes. To that end, a lot of older adults are faced with having to decide between medication, food, or housing costs. These results can be catastrophic. Those decisions can be catastrophic. In the immediate, A&D has partnered with the Department of Housing and Community Affairs with their newly uh, appointed work group to really um, deep dive and solve for housing disparities among low and low to middle income older adults in the county. As chief, I will continue that partnership and deepen our uh, make sure that we're at the table for that discussion. Of course, Aging and Disability Services is not, is not the lead entity to solve for that, but we definitely want to be a part of the discussion as 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 we need to be. Also, we can't forget about those in institutional settings. Right? So we know that um, we cannot forget about those older adults in nursing homes, assisted living, and uh, in, uh, in group homes, and, and individuals with disabilities as well. The cost of institutional care can be burdensome. From a local perspective, you all are fully aware that there was an MOU in place, a memorandum of understanding with the county um, and the state to conduct inspections here in the county that MOU sunset in 2021. Since our uh, long-term care ombudsman program within a and has had an uptick in, in the amount of calls that we're receiving. Um, and so our long-term care ombudsman team, it's important to understand they have no enforcement, but they are prioritizing being in our nursing home facilities to work with residents, to educate them about their rights, as well as um, um, meet with families and, and, the, and the facility to try to um, our conversations between them and, and, and ensure that um, residents are um, aware of their programs and services. The county has remained in a posture of advocacy in this conversation uh, with the state and we are seeking solutions and, remain, and, and, and ensuring that we um, maintain the conversation with the state to potentially reinstate the MOU. Now that will not be an easy lift. We will have to establish a new team um, because the public health services, of course, no longer has that team. So that is an ongoing discussion that we're having. So we wanna make sure that we continue to have our pulse on the finger of what's going on in our nursing home facilities. A significant portion, as I stated, of older adults live alone. Social isolation has, was increased due to COVID and a lot of calls were made to emergency services as a result of loneliness. This also created more mental health challenges in older adults and persons with disabilities. So we are, a and has been in conversations with uh, our Department of Public Health, I mean, excuse me, our Department of Behavioral Health to have discussions about intergenerational opportunities, innovative opportunities to um, um, educate grandparents about um, mental health strategies and have them mobilize to provide services across uh, in the intergenerational space. We know that uh, there are service gaps um, for persons with disabilities, uh, particularly for transitioning youth, transitioning from high school, transitioning from the foster care system. Um, so we, I envision that our new Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission will take up the charge to look at this 
uh, these service gaps, but not only the service gaps, but mental health disparities and affordable housing in the disability community. So excited about that commission because they're going to have the ability to um, lobby in, in Annapolis for change. Um, so we're looking forward to working with, with that group. And so these are some of the disparities that we see in this population. Sure. Thank you for that. Uh, with regard to the county's uh, racial equity and social justice law, uh, what measures would you take to advance uh, social justice and uh, racial equity and social justice and uh, health care disparities here? As a member of the BIPOC community, I feel that um, I want to acknowledge and appreciate the county's acknowledgement in this space uh, to racial equity and social justice. That's step one, acknowledging it. Um, learning and hearing from BIPOC communities must be prioritized. Um, I think my colleague says it best when she says there's no cookie cutter approach, uh, that it's not a one size fit all. So really deepening our, our, our listening sessions and understanding from BIPOC communities what they deem as a need is something that we must prioritize and move forward on. The communities um, that this impact, it, it's not necessarily, the access issues are not necessarily um, the lack of services, but that it may not be in their backyard. So accessing transportation or language barriers um, could be a, a barrier to services. I, I have to share um, that when I first moved here, I moved amid the pandemic when we were still in lockdown. <laughs> so one of my favorite activities was going to the grocery store and listening to the multiple languages. Montgomery County is rich in its diversity. So to celebrate that is, is necessary. And I, and, I, and I just remember thinking to myself, I've landed in a wonderful place. My hometown is not a diverse <laughs> place. And Montgomery County is truly a melting pot. And I have lived experiences. Um, with racial inequity as well, clearly being a member of the BIPOC community, but going back to my lived experience with my mother and trying to access services um, from, from physicians that looked like us, it was easier for them to um, hear from us and, and help us, um, but far too often that was not the case. So I have a lived experience and, and hearing from the community about their lived experiences will help us drive those changes. Thank you. Now, many of the much of the work and services within the Aging and Disability uh, Services uh, Agency have extensive interactions with uh, state uh, partners. And so, can you share uh, your experience working uh, in an intergovernmental and interagency capacity? Yes. Thank you for that question, Council President. So, much of the work that I've done in the public sector has um, required partnership at the state level. Um, so I have worked um, with programs to make sure that we're adhering to those regulations that they establish. Uh, the COMARs that are, uh, that, that are established here in Maryland, we make sure that we are adhering to those when we are implementing our programs and services. And that requires relationship with our state partners, ongoing conversations to make sure that we are driving change in the right direction. Um, so I've been at the helm of those conversations. I have strong partnerships. Uh, with the Maryland Department of Aging as well as the Maryland Department of Health. Um, our new Secretary of Aging was actually, uh, she spent the day here last week. So it was, it was quite an event. Um, we had an opportunity to sit in dialogue with her program staff, of, was afforded the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. Um, and so that just, that, that goes to the, the, the passion that exists on both sides, but also the need to ensure that we have a good working partnership with our state partners. From a local perspective, um, recently I worked with um, WorkSource Montgomery as a co-lead for uh, Department of Health and Human Services on the county executives uh, appointed Home and Community-Based Services Workforce Task Force. Um, this was um, a project that um, incorporated many, many of our community partners, great community partners that we work with here in Montgomery County coming to the table to really do a deep dive and understand 
um, the home and community-based services labor shortages. So we did a, a full examination and, and came up with 26 credible, comprehensive uh, recommendations that we have actually put forth in front of uh, our uh, county executive, but also our um, HHS president, uh, Albernos. Uh, we were able to share those and and across the space. It was a collaboration uh, of hard work, but necessary work. And working with Mort M WorkSource Montgomery, um, who would be the lead entity for a lot of the projects that we that we put forth as far as recommendations, it's a great partner. Um, with a in the A&D space and we're wanting to make sure that we continue uh, that collaboration and move those recommendations forward because the work that that labor force does is vital in the aging and disability space they provide those in-home services that are crucial to individuals aging in place so we want to make sure that we um, continue to grow our community partnerships um, strengthen the ones that we have listen to our boards, commissions, our committees. We have very active, vocal, passionate boards and committees within the aging and disability space. Our Commission on Aging wows me frequently um, with their advocacy efforts. So it's, it's important that we continue to drive um, these relationships forward. Um, like I said, I've, I've had opportunities to be at the helm of these conversations. And from the chief seat, I will continue to deepen our relationships. Fantastic. Uh, last question for me. Are there any conflicts of interest of which the council should be aware? There are none. Very good. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the chair of Health and Human Services Committee, Council Member Albernos. Uh, Dr. McGee, it's great to see you. Thank great. you so much for your service and your willingness to step forward in this important role. I commend the administration once again for making a really exciting appointment. And you fall in the great footsteps of Dr. Brunetto and Dr. Kenny before that, who I had the opportunity to work with directly in a variety of different programs, services, projects, you name it. Um, and I know you're going to carry forward that, that really outstanding tradition. And you did a great job um, when the secretary came and visited in your comments. Um, they were thoughtful and aspirational, um, but also very much doable. Uh, so you did a great job. Um, I just had one rather it's a big question. I don't ex expect you to, to dissect it completely, but um, both populations are growing rapidly, aging and our disability population. And of course, there are many nuanced challenges and categories uh, within each of those respective populations. And there have been comments in the past that the division, while there's clear crossover, lots of it, uh, between our aging and disability community, given the growing needs of both particular uh, categories of residents, does it continue to make sense to have there be a combined effort or should we be looking at um, an effort that maybe focuses more on each individual category of resident? Um, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. Um, I think the department's doing a great job, but I'd just be curious as to your position on that and how you will continue again the longstanding effort of trying to provide services to both unique populations. So thank you for that question. <laughs> thank you for that question, council member. So the answer to your question, there's, there's two sides. So yes and no, <laughs> combined efforts. Um, so I, I recently had an opportunity to attend um, the primary care coalitions. They, they've, um, assembled a work group to really look at um, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities and try to work parallel with the new commission. In that meeting, there were a lot of similarities between the disability space and the aging space. In addition to the Home and Community-Based Services Workforce Task Force that I led um, in collaboration with WorkSource Montgomery, we had um, disability partners on that task force. And there were, again, a lot of similarities, but there were also some stark differences. And as a result, um, we decided that it would be best to look at them, uh, both issues, uh, both groups separately, and to examine, examine them that way. So for uh, 
the example that I laid out about affordable housing, that hits both groups. Um, so that is something that we can look at in, in parallel for both aging and persons with disabilities. But then the surface gap differences only exist in the, as far as the transitioning youth piece and, and, and no services being available uh, for individuals that are not connected to the school system or, or, those, uh, or the six to 18 year olds in the disability space. Um, that's just on that side of the house. But then in aging, um, as you age, you lose the people that you're connected to. So it's, it's um, the social isolation piece is, is more dire on that side. It may exist on the disability side, but you know, it, it could be more dire on the uh, older adult side. So again, to answer your question, it is good to look at some of the issues in parallel and, and look at them and solve for issues that could, um, that could, uh, could work for both aging and persons with disabilities. But it's, it's also important to really identify those, uh, those differences and, and, work and work on them separately. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I also very much appreciated your comments, uh, calling out and acknowledging the new IDD Commission, um, which I know is um, already up and running. And so we look forward to the collaboration and partnership both through the committee and our office individually. And congratulations again on being here before us today. I look forward to voting for your nomination. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you so much for joining us today and applying for this position. Um, really um, great to um, see you again after the press conference um, you hosted last week. Um, had a question about um, two-way communication because, um, you know, I know that the county provides excellent um, resources and information, um, but how will you ensure that um, you're well informed on these issues, on the issues um, our communities are facing, and then how will you um, improve uh, how committees are informed about uh, the resources that the county provides, um, knowing about the challenges with accessibility, with um, these populations um, just want to ensure that um, we understand that it's a high priority uh, during the uh, budget season the um, aging um, and disability services uh, requested a communications position um, that did not happen I just want to make sure that this is top of mind so I want to hear your thoughts and ideas thank you First, I want to thank you for that question, council member. So ensuring uh, bi-directional com uh, communications is vital. Um, I think, as I mentioned, I do not operate in a silo. I ensure that we have um, communication. I communicate with staff to understand what's going on at the program level regularly. In addition, I ensure that I inform them, because we have regularly scheduled meetings, I inform them of, of, of top level um, information that comes from my director on down, ensuring that staff are fully aware of that. So that's the internal approach. From an external approach, um, I will continue the, the, the legacy that was laid before me. Our boards and commissions meet regularly, and we don't just wait till the meeting to share information. We um, ensure that we collaborate and work with them uh, frequently, sending communication using multiple communication channels. Our Aging and Disability Resource Unit, which is our access point um, for and starting point for all services within aging and disability services, we promote that number frequently. We're looking at right now uh, more communication vehicles to get that information out. Um, we. Um, are working with our ARPA funding that we uh, secured from the ARPA grant. We are working with a, um, a seasoned contractor to really look at our communication strategies so that the community will know more about the services that we offer. Um, 
in that deep dive um, for our area plan, we, we have to submit an area plan regularly, uh, annually, excuse me, to the state. We really looked at um, our communications in that and, and we did a community need survey where we understood uh, and listened to our community about what is needed, what is lacking, and, and, and it was informative about what's not known <laughs> in the aging and disability space. So really having meetings with staff and, 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 and trying to understand how we um, increase our outreach and education. And again, like I said, working with our, um, our boards and commissions. But we're also looking to deepen our integration in HHS. As you all know, we're well positioned in HHS with six uh, service areas. And so reaching across those service areas and working together to meet the needs of our community is, is vital. Uh, I know our director is prioritizing how we are looking at the social determinants of health and how we are providing services in the county. And so continuing to um, uh, champion that cause and, and reach across, um, reach across our um, service area. Uh, and then the final point I would make is we've always made sure that we've informed our boards and commissions and informed them enough so that they can set their priorities based on those those learnings. So we, I will make sure that we prioritize that and continue to, uh, to do that moving forward. Thank you. And I know that you visited um, one of the uh, senior activity centers. I hope that continues to be a regular occurrence throughout your administration. Welcome. Uh, well, Dr. McGee, thank you uh, for sharing more about yourself and your vision for this position. Um, and uh, Mr. Madalino and Dr. Bridgers uh, for uh, being here and being partners with us in this work as we recognize that our uh, aging community uh, is quickly growing, uh, not only here in the county but also in the region. And uh, we will be uh, taking up your appointment uh, next week on July 25th and look forward to getting to work with you. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. President, I, yes. I, I do want to um, reiterate the comment that um, Councilmember Albernos made about the outstanding legacy of the leaders in this division. To thank Dr. Brunetto for her career of service for the county. She joined the county before there was a Department of Health and Human yes. Services. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kenny before him, before her, who also spent a career with the county government. So, she definitely is stepping in. Um, to follow, I think what's fair to say, two legends yes. um, across county government, and um, we expect her, the county executive, I, the Dr. Bridgers, to be able to uh, to to excel in that in that role. We thank you for your questions and respectfully ask for her confirmation. Big shoes to fill, high expectations. We look forward to getting to work. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, we are now going to move to district council session. And the first item for consideration is ZTA 2302, Regulatory Approvals, Mixed-Use Housing Community. Uh, Vice President Friedson will share the report out for the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee's recommendations. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you to uh, committee colleagues. Uh, this was a measure that was introduced uh, by myself, Councilmember Sales. She noted uh, earlier today, uh, co-sponsored by Council Members Lutke, Stewart, and the Council President. Uh, we took this uh, item up. Uh, at committee and have a committee recommendation before. Uh, just to summarize, um, the, the goal of this uh, is to provide a significantly expedited development review process. This was modeled after the biohealth zoning text amendment that I had introduced in the previous council and council member sales and I worked together uh, to uh, adopt this for qualified affordable housing uh, uh, projects. Uh, the uh, introduction uh, required at least 150,000 square feet of uh, uh, new uh, projects. Um, it uh, included uh, uh, requirements for uh, commercial uses, two commercial uses, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, it would uh, require uh, 30 or more dwelling units and either 50% of the units 
uh, satisfying an MPDU uh, requirement or a DHC uh, equivalent or 35% at MPDU with 15% uh, uh, deeply affordable at 30%. And we'll get to that in a minute because the committee actually uh, adopted some uh, changes to the affordability requirements as well. Um, and then other provisions uh, that were not changed uh, include a waiver for parking minimums within a half mile uh, of a red uh, policy area uh, for a planned or existing bus rapid transit route uh, and um, uh, allowing uh, for uh, uses in uh, 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 all zones where multi-unit living is currently uh, allowed. Um, recognition here is obviously we have a housing challenge. This is a, a day where we have focused quite a bit uh, on uh, this issue. We need as many tools in the toolbox as possible. One of the challenges is that it takes too long to build new housing and we want to make it easier uh, to build uh, housing by reducing the regulatory burden. The uh, goal of this uh, provision like it was in the biohealth zoning text amendment is it essentially reduces the amount of regulatory review by about 75 percent. So this is a significant reduction uh, and uh, ultimately um, we hope will lead to a lot more uh, affordable housing uh, units. Uh, the committee took up two main amendments. I just wanted to note them uh, here, uh, two changes. Uh, one of them is related to affordability levels. Uh, we made a slight adjustment to one of the affordability levels, but we actually created a menu of four different uh, affordability levels where an applicant could pick any one of these uh, four. So one of them is that 50% of the units are affordable uh, to 60% or less of area me median income with 10% of the units uh, at deeply affordable uh, rates, 30% or less, um, and 20% uh, at MPDU level. Um, 20% of the units uh, affordable to 50% or less AMI and 10% affordable uh, at MPDU uh, level. Uh, and then the, the final would be any 9% uh, LIHTC, low income housing tax credit project. These are very competitive uh, federal uh, projects and we wanna help expedite those through the review if they have already gone through the rigorous uh, federal uh, review uh, process. I'll just note that these affordability levels actually adopt affordability levels that we already have in other programs. So we took the pilot bill uh, for nonprofit uh, pilots to get non-discretionary pilots. That is a standard that you could qualify under this uh, based on the committee's uh, recommendations. Um, and so we have uh, tried to adopt uh, different areas. Another one is uh, in the $100 million uh, uh, Housing Opportunities uh, Commission uh, fund, uh, the, uh, 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 the Housing Production Fund. Uh, the affordability standards in that housing production fund to qualify uh, in that would also qualify you into this. So we try to create both more options and also uh, a higher level of consistency with existing affordable housing projects as part of the layering of tools in housing affordability as we, uh, as we uh, uh, hope uh, to uh, accomplish. Um, the other issue we heard quite a bit besides affordability levels and wanting to have more options uh, was on the commercial requirement. And we heard from stakeholders in the affordable housing community, particularly the nonprofit housing community that uh, significantly advocated uh, for it being an option, but not a requirement, noting the challenges in affordable housing projects in general and the uh, challenges in, uh, in commercial and retail uses and the concern about having empty uh, spaces or in holding up projects uh, altogether. Uh, we heard from planning who also recommended making it uh, an option and not a requirement. That was adopted two to one uh, with council member Jawando uh, uh, opposing uh, that and wanting to uh, uh, keep a, uh, a non-residential requirement. There's a, uh, a, an amendment in the packet uh, that I'm sure council member uh, Jawando and perhaps uh, council member sales uh, will speak to later. I'll hold off on my comments uh, on that uh, particular uh, amendment, but I do think that the committee's recommendation uh, was attempting to receive the overwhelming feedback that we have from the stakeholders who do this work uh, and understand uh, how these projects uh, proceed and try to make sure that we are uh, putting in place a regulatory opportunity to streamline the process that will actually be used uh, and will actually make a difference uh, in the housing uh, 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 dynamic uh, in the housing proposals. And then the last piece uh, is related to the name change. I actually think regardless of what we do on the um, 
on the uh, 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 amendment, whether we adopt the committee's uh, recommendation as before the body or another amendment related to uh, non-commercial uh, uses. Even the amendment is so uh, narrowly tailored that uh, the uh, information from the planning department is it's preferred to have a name that reflects the overwhelming majority uh, you know, of uh, what it takes to, to qualify. And so the, there was a two to zero to, to one. Council member Jawando abstained. Uh, on a name change, but the committee recommended uh, changing the name from mixed use housing community to mixed income uh, housing community because uh, all projects, regardless uh, of um, uh, any amendments or waivers or otherwise, uh, would have to meet affordability thresholds that would create a mixed income uh, community, which is uh, really the focus uh, of uh, uh, of the, the ZTAs recommended uh, before the body. So. Uh, with that, let me turn it to uh, Ms. Nadu and thank her for all of her work and efforts. Thank the planning department for all of their efforts. Thank the affordable housing providers for all of their uh, comments and um, uh, can then yield back to you, Mr. President. Okay. Ms. Nadu. Um, I have nothing to add at this time if um, Councilmember Jawando or Councilmember Sales wanted to discuss the amendment, unless there's any questions. There we go. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, and um, thank you to the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee for uh, their thoughtful feedback and analysis on the OPEN ZTA, Opening Pathways to Economic Necessity, sponsored by Councilmember Friesen and myself. Um, earlier today, we talked about rent stabilization, and the conversation will continue. Uh, this piece of legislation proposes a thoughtful alternative to increasing our supply of affordable housing. Um, I know that all of my colleagues on the council share my desire to increase the quantity of affordable housing in this county, but we need to be careful to do so in a way that does not reduce equity. Uh, the original intent of OPEN was to provide an incentive for developers to produce more affordable housing units and to do so in a way that would ensure equitable access to all communities in our diverse county. This bill and its sister SRA would allow for a complete community to be developed on an accelerated timeline. Um, we just heard the numbers were 30,000 units short. By allowing this expedited process to apply to more multi-use buildings, there's an increased risk that they could be left out of the design entirely if we do not require amenities to be present. Uh, doing this can potentially increase the disparities that black and brown communities in Montgomery County already have with limited access to complete 15-minute communities. Furthermore, this bill, since this bill does not apply to all housing projects, um, we should prioritize how it is used to incentivize further um, kinds of complete communities that the council has advocated for. Complete communities. 15-minute living near the metro with less reliance on vehicles and more access to grocery stores and other amenities that our families need. Uh, the benefits of these kinds of developments are numerous in terms of economic and health outcomes. Um, I encourage my colleagues to join me in taking the more prudent approach and support a non-residential requirement understanding that if it is not used, it is much easier to remove it down the line than to add it back in. And I will turn it over to Councilmember Jawando to share more on his um, amendment to the original legislation. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Sales, uh, and to my colleagues on PHP. Um, I, just to add on to uh, what Councilmember Sales mentioned, we and others, we need more housing, so this is a good thing. We, we, we should pass this and speed it up, particularly for affordable at the different levels discussed. But one thing that comes up time and time again, and as I sit on this side, of, I'm still getting used to sitting on this side of the dais, but my good friend, Councilmember Navarro, used to say this quite often. In the East County and other parts of the county where it, uh, it is always going to be uh, desirable to build more housing because you need it, but the profitability of that is in the housing. It's not in the commercial side. And what happens is you get oversaturation sometimes of housing or uh, that's probably the wrong word to use. You get less amenities in certain parts of the county 
based on the desire to fulfill an important need in more housing. Um, and so we had a discussion in committee um, and I've seen this play out over the years. And again, it's important to remember that this CTA would just provide an expedited process. This is to speed up and give you an incentive to do something that we want you to do. In this case, build more housing, but also as the original intent of the ZTA to also require more commercial usage. Hearing from our community uh, in the nonprofit development sector and others uh, in talking with the planning board, uh, I have offered a very narrowly tailored uh, way to still get at that core intent. Um, and as it's described in the packet, that we would only require non-residential uses, which I did support. I think that's good because it could be a gym, it could be, it could, it could be a number of, it could be a library, it could be a whole bunch of different things that are not, that are community amenities that aren't necessarily uh, businesses. Uh, but only require non-residential uses in the commercial, residential, and employment zones. Um, and I'm going to ask Ms. Nadu to just describe that as distinguished from the residential multi-unit zones. So the idea here was that there are um, various types of uses in the use table, which is included in the packet. But in the commercial, residential, and employment zones, there's a lot more options for commercial uses. So in the residential multi-unit um, zones, there aren't that many commercial uses that are even allowed, which would have made a requirement in those zones difficult for a developer to achieve. So by narrowing it to just the commercial, residential, and employment zones, there'll be a wider menu of non-residential options for developers to use and satisfy this requirement. Um, the second piece of that is that, um, sorry, one second, is that because there's gonna be two uses required, um, that would allow people to either do a coffee shop, a library, a park, all those types of uses that are not necessarily commercial, but still allowed in both of those families of zones. And I want to note this is the family of zones, so it's all the commercial residential zones and all the employment zones. Right. Thank you for that clarification. So the first part of my amendment would be to only require non-residential uses in these zones that we have designated already to be commercial and employment zones, uh, and then uh, also allow, uh, as planning asked, for a clarification of the waiver. So you still, if, if you, there could be a situation where it's just not feasible in, in, even in a, a commercial or employment zone. And you can apply for a waiver to, to that, uh, to the planning board uh, for, to not have to do a non-residential use. So that's what the, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, and there's a test, there's three factors there and that's laid out in the memo, but that's basically what the amendment would do. Require it only in these employment commercial zones non-resident and then uh, have a waiver process so we keep the original intent so I'd like to move that. Uh, so there's a motion on the table moved by Councilmember Jawando, seconded by Councilmember Sales. Uh, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you Mr. President. Thank you Councilmember Jawando. I really appreciate you moving this forward. Thank you again to Councilmember Sales for your leadership uh, on this and your thoughtfulness. And I appreciate the fact that this is a significantly scaled down version that is trying to narrowly tailor it uh, which is better, uh, certainly. I still have uh, some concerns that I'll uh, I explain. The uh, And I appreciate the intent, and by the way, I think everybody here wants the goal as described uh, by Council Member Sales. Certainly, we all share that uh, in, in many ways. The question is whether or not this is the right tool to achieve it, or whether there are uh, uh, responses to this that will undermine the broader goal of the housing in general. Uh, so uh, the, the the first challenge is we've heard overwhelmingly from the affordable housing community that this is a problem. And I do think we should be listening to the people who are actually doing the work. And these aren't you know big, bad, evil developers. These are our nonprofit affordable housing partners who almost exclusively work on deals where they are partnering with the county, where we provide them funding to do these deals. We are asking for an aggressive amount of affordable housing here that would make most projects not viable in any form or fashion and anybody who comes even close to this even less than this is already getting lots of other benefits because we really this is so much higher than anything that we would normally ask the market to produce uh, on its own so i just think it's important to, to note we're not talking about you know market rate developments here we are talking about 
huge levels of affordability that we couldn't imagine achieving through the market uh, alone. Uh, the, the challenge that, and concern that, that, that I have, even in, in the amendment, is number one on the waiver, even though there is a waiver here, the waiver timeline that we heard from planning would undermine the timing of the ZTA. That the whole point of the ZTA is to streamline the process. If there is time for a waiver, that slows down the process that even when we had originally done the last ZTA, planning expressed concerns of their ability to deliver this aggressive timeline, adding another wrinkle into that timeline with a waiver process takes time and time is the enemy of the goal here which is to you know dramatically uh, reduce the timeline the second uh, piece of it is um, the to to have the building have to require the the two uses those units could that 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 square footage of that unit that could be housing will be could be empty and all evidence suggests that there's a high likelihood that it will be empty because the retail and commercial market is very challenged uh, right right now. Uh, and so the worst case scenario is the vacant storefronts that we see in uh, communities across the county that we're desperately trying to fix and undo. And I have real concerns uh, about that. And if we're then uh, also uh, having uh, a uh, conversion to housing ultimately because if eventually it just can't be done and there's allowed uh, to be a waiver after the fact it's it, it's built the question is you know whether that adds cost that could have been used to add to the affordability because it's not being built to a residential standard it's being built to a commercial standard which is different um, but it also denies the ability to create a, a, a localized amenity like a nicer lobby or you know other things that a market rate housing unit it, it you know maybe getting in that area that this community this housing unit would not be uh therefore getting so i, I just I, I think the more that we have heard from stakeholders the more that we have uh, understood what the implications would be the more that we've heard from the actual planning experts who are going to uh, implement this uh, the more i believe that this is not the right tool to try to achieve that very important goal uh, and why i think the committee uh, recommendation as presented uh, to the council is the best path forward to achieve what we all uh, hope. Uh, and so with that, I will not be supporting uh, the amendment and would urge colleagues to uh, support the committee uh, recommendation as presented to the council. Council Member Albernaz. Uh, thanks. First, I want to give a big shout out to Anila Shemsu, uh, who is my summer rise intern uh, and is a senior, a rising senior at Wooten High School. and. One of her tasks was to brief me on this particular policy, and she crushed it. <laughs> she did a really good job. Um, so thank you, Anila. Uh, so I guess my next question for Ms. Nadu: have the nonprofit providers weighed in formally on this uh, in one way or the other? I know there have been individual conversations, but, um, but just if we could share some of that feedback that they've given, that would be helpful. The testimony that the council had received from them was that because the way it usually works in mixed use is the commercial is offset by the market rate, that if you're going to do affordable housing, then it becomes difficult economically to do the deeply affordable in addition to the commercial. So that was the written testimony that we had received from them. Gotcha. And I see planning staff is here. And planning staff is here, And yes. I'd love to hear from them if that's okay, Mr. President. Sure. Um, I did have Mr. one Bonnie, quick correction on the amendment. Um, so the waiver, when we talked about it at committee, there was discussion about whether the waiver would add time to the process. So under Councilmember Jawando's amendment, it's not going to add additional time because instead, if you meet the three requirements, you just automatically don't have to do non-residential. So I just wanted to make that quick note. Thank you. Lisa Gazzoni for the record, Planning Department. Um, through our examination and analysis on the zoning tax amendment, we met with Montgomery Housing Alliance, who expressed concerns about the commercial component too. Uh, we also met individually with HOC, MHP, AHC, uh, all the acronyms for affordable housing development. We tried to get their feedback and they all expressed concern about the commercial aspect of it. Thank you. Um, that's important to note. We pass ETAs that sometimes don't get used with the best of intentions. Uh, they're just sitting on the books. Um, but when you 
uh, it's been my experience in this body that when you try to pack too much in and you overcomplicate some of these ETAs, then it defeats the purpose of introduction in the first place. And I think we've all acknowledged um, that the priority is the housing. Um, and while I very much appreciate and respect the concern and the intent of, and, and the approach of trying to find a compromise and be narrow, uh, that, that for me was, was very helpful. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thank you. I um, want to first express my appreciation to Councilmember Sales and Councilmember Friedson for putting this together. This is important. Um, and as a representative of District 5 in East County, uh, the original intent of the bill is really important for me, especially as I think about what my community is asking for uh, and what they need and what they deserve. Um, and you know they, they want more amenities and it, it's been going to other places and so acknowledging that you know it's hard to find the perfect tool that everybody is going to sign off on and say yes this is going to give you all of everything that you want with no unintended consequences uh, we're never going to have that when it comes to development uh, you, you know we, we look at the best data that we have we make our best guesses uh, we make adjustments along the way this is one of those adjustments right because the unintended consequences of the way that we have been doing things before is that east county has not gotten the type of investment and the type of amenities that other areas of the county have gotten when i talk to residents in east county and in district five um, of course, they, they agree with all of us up here that we need more housing in the county, absolutely. Um, but they want to see you know, the, the, their fair share of other things as well, of the amenities. And so my understanding was that the, that was the original intent of the bill. I was excited about that. I, you know, I think that Councilmember Sales raised a good point when she said that it's easier to, to pull this piece back if we're not getting the results that we want, if there are issues there, than it is to put it in. So although there are some questions and concerns, um, I, I think when it comes to making you know, tweaks and changes and adjustments and efforts to correct the inequities of, you know, of, of the past, um, I, I think sometimes we have to step out and give those things a try. And I think that this is uh, a very reasonable balance uh, that Council Members Rwando and Sales have, have struck here. Um, and, and I would ask my, you know, I think that regardless that this is an important bill, an important measure, uh, and, and I certainly appreciate all of the comments of my colleagues and the work of my colleagues, and I, and I know that we are um, aligned in, in goals here. Now, we all really want to see a lot of housing, and I want to see this get over the line. I would ask my colleagues to, to consider um, giving this piece of it a chance, because for districts like District 5, um, providing that added incentive is important. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. There we go. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and I too want to thank my colleagues uh, for presenting this and, and for uh, having the discussions. I, I'm in favor of the committee recommendation. And options uh, are much easier to do than mandatory. If, in, as we all know, brick and mortar businesses are, and I understand this is not just for businesses, but Brick and mortar businesses are not as plentiful as they used to be. And even when they used to be, this becomes a difficult uh, space. I do not agree that it's easier to pull something back because in some cases, the building out of the commercial space makes it very difficult to make it residential space. And so we have that as a concern. Um, if this option uh, is something that a builder would want to do, they would do it because it's profitable and they would not have to be required to do it. They would do it on their own. Obviously, to be as flexible as we can to get what we need to have makes a lot more sense. And I can tell you, air experiences, and, and, and uh, council member sales have seen this too. In Gaithersburg, was, this was strictly very mixed. Um, and it wasn't, I don't know if it was mandatory or not. I don't think it was. But we have seen at least one apartment complex on East Diamond Avenue that has never, ever had first floor commercial because it didn't work. And, and you have to figure out how it's going to park, and you have to figure out wh who the tenants are, and you have to figure out if, if it was going to be a restaurant, and the venting wasn't right. This 
to me, the way to go about this is to is to let the flexibility be there, let it be optional, and then we'll see how, ma how many people want to do it uh, to to get the uh, the additional commercial space. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. Yeah, I just had a question about um, the purpose of these accelerated timelines are to provide incentives. Um, and I think, um, as my colleagues have shared, that this provision would make it an option. We've talked about, um, I believe, um, Councilmember Jawando's um, amendment also includes um, um, the uh, um, the distance of new developments, mixed-use developments near commercial spaces. So if your new development is already near within five miles of a shopping center, you won't be required to, um, you know, uh, have the two commercial uses. You know, I'm glad that Councilmember Mink brought up, you know, the underinvestment in um, East County. We have seen over the years, you can drive through any commercial district in this county and you know where investments are happening and where they are not. We already know this will not cause an undue burden on our planning commission with uh, any um, long uh, uh, extended timeline for review. Um, we also know that the uh, ZTA that this was built upon has had zero applications. So is it a perfect bill? Are we going to change the biotech ZTA? Are we getting uh, biotech companies to go to other parts of this county? Yes. Um, this is the whole purpose of the ZTA is to incentivize those who are going to do the right things in our community when they build affordable housing. They are not going to build affordable housing in food deserts. They are not going to build affordable housing in places where people can't access transportation. Is there a problem? Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I want us to engage in respectful conversation. We all have a chance at the microphone, and anyone else who wants to offer any other comments on this ZTA, um, you're more than welcome to do so. I yield. Thank you. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez. Um, when this ZTA came to the PHP committee, I even said it, I don't love it. I did not like it, but I'm going to deal with it. Um, I don't think we need it at all. I'm glad that the planning department is working on the Fairland uh, in Briggs Cheney master plan that focuses on East County. Those issues that we're talking about here actually dealt through a master plan process or sector plan process, not this. We're just adding more, um, it looks great on paper, but I don't think it's practical and I will not do something just because it looks great on paper that will damage or impact the affordable housing that we do need in Montgomery County. Besides that, this idea that we don't require amenities in, in applications is so false. Every single applicant that comes to the planning board is required to provide amenities, be in a playground space. I have had applicants coming in to provide a lane for schools. I mean, you name it. Is there sidewalks, street lighting, removing poles so we can have sidewalks, I what I think is that, and I I'm gonna make a request to the chair of the PHP committee. Maybe we should have a session and invite everybody on the county council just to go over the the development review process. Although it's being updated as we speak by the state, um, but at some point we had to. I will not. I'm gonna stick with my PHP recommendation and not uh, move forward with the amendments being proposed. Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, I, as always, you know, when you hit your button, you've got one thing to say, but once everybody speaks, I've got, you know, 11 things to say. You know what button you push. <laughs> yeah, you push my buttons, that's a, no doubt. 
Um, so, so absolutely that this, this goal is an important goal uh, to have affordable housing with, with um, mixed use, mixed uses, uh, ideally commercial, but certainly non-residential. That's, that's an important goal. Um, but it is, not only is it hard from, from an uh, affordable housing perspective, because the residential units often pay for that, for that non-residential non uses, it's really hard for market rate units. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time on um, looking at retail and non-residential uses with, um, with buildings. And the pendulum has swung back. I mean, six, seven, eight years ago, it was required to have uh, retail on the bottom when you built a building, and it just didn't work in, in the market space. Um, I was a, a co-chair of the implementation for the Great Seneca Science Corridor, and we worked on that for a very long time, and it just simply didn't work, even with market rate. Um, and so, and I also think it's important when we talk about amenities, um, we're, ta we're not talking about public amenities. And so from um, Council Member Mink's perspective, I understand that, you know, I, I, my, my, I, come, I represent a district that doesn't often get uh, what we think we, we need uh, in the up county. So I, I recognize that, uh, but these amenities, even if it, I, I think they are amenities, but they're not public amenities. They're paid for um, by the the builder and developer, and and that. So if it's not a commercial space, they're just paying for it outright without any return. If it is a commercial space, then we're relying on the market, and if the market was able to bear the unit the unit would already be there because the market would dictate the, that, that um, building and establishment. So I think that's important to note. Um, I, think that, I think that certainly amenities in areas um, with uh, deeply affordable units is a, is a very important goal and uh, not only a goal, a responsibility. And I think that's something that we need to look at as a body of how we make sure that we have amenities throughout the county and particularly uh, with our, at our affordable unit perspective. Um, I did wanna, um, in the, the, new, the new jargon, double tap, I'm starting to try to put that into my vocabulary. <laughs> I'm gonna double tap on um, something from the, um, Planning Board's, um, uh, their comments, um, Circle 27, um, and I think that this, so if we expedite everything, then nothing is expedited, right? And so I think the goal, uh, our overall goal, my overall goal is to expedite everything, to get to a point where we don't have the, this uh, time lag. Time is money in the development world and the time lag to get something uh, from idea to, to uh, opening the door is just too long. Um, and so we need to look at the expedite, which we are. I mean, yeah, we, we are. are looking at that. Um, however, I am, I do think that um, the, the issue of looking at all of the, in, the expediting incentives um, to make sure that we're not at a point where, you know, if everybody gets, uh, if everybody gets to the front of the line, then nobody's at the front of the line. Um, so I think that that's something uh, separate and apart from what happens here. We need to look at how we're incentivizing the expedited process. Um, so those are just my, my comments. I, I think that um, the goal is, is incredibly important, um, but we spent all morning talking about housing. We're gonna spend the rest of the afternoon talking about housing affordability. And I, I want to um, focus on getting affordable housing built. Um, and I think that a requirement 
uh, for commercial space will impede that. Um, thank you. We do have a lot of talking about housing affordability ahead of us. Councilmember Jawando. I, I got the message uh, there. Um, I just want to clarify because it's been interchanged a lot. These are non-residential uses, not commercial uses, which is a much larger set of uses. Even, you know, Ms. Gavoni, who I love, uh, said commercial a couple times. It's not just commercial, it's non-residential. Um, and I appreciate also Ms. Nadu clarifying that this would not extend the time period, so to keep the core of what the goal is expediting. And I, I agree with Councilmember Balcom that, like, you know, the, what's ex, if every, you know, what are we expediting? And But, you know, these are imperfect tools. Um, and I remember, you know, I'm having deja vu when we did the biomedical one. I offered a similar amendment. It wasn't similar. It was similar in the sense that it offered a bifurcated process to achieve racial equity goals, which I would put amenities in communities that don't have them as a large, high racial equity goal. Um, and it, it's frustrating to me personally, and I know this is not the intention of any colleagues, to always hear, well, this isn't the right tool. We can't do it here. This won't work perfectly. Um, I just think we have to be about the business of every time injecting a racial equity uh, lens into all that we're doing. And, I, and the housing ones here is, certainly is, is part of that. Um, and so I, I get the tension, but um, I just wanted to, to say that I think this is doable. Uh, I think it's it's instructive that the biomedical, even though it passed as as is without that uh, amendment I offered to that, is I guess uh, is not being utilized at this point. Um, so we hope that that changes. But that was the intent of this initial ZTA to do both things. Um, and you know, so I just I just hope that you know we'll keep we'll keep at it. But this is a serious issue. I hear it from residents all the time. Oh, you, there's, they're building another, you know, they're building some more housing over here. And what, when, when is the other stuff coming? And, and we don't have perfect control over it, but this is a, I think, a small way that we can send a signal we're sensitive to that. Um, I appreciate my colleagues' uh, comments. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Great, thank you. I just want to say thank you very much to Councilmember Sales for and uh, Friedson, um, but particularly Councilmember Sales for raising these points. Um, and discussing it and to council member Jawando for trying to find a way forward. Um, I'm a bit torn uh, on this because I see the points that we want to do and I also hear loud and clear from our affordable housing um, partners um, and what they're telling us uh, they'd like to see and do and so I think weighing all the options um, for today I'm, I'm going to um, support the committee recommendations but hope that we can continue to work on this issue because I think the points that were raised are incredibly important and again I just want to thank um, Councilmember Sales for raising these points and I hope we can continue working on it. Councilmember Allen has. Thanks I'll be brief I swear. Um, oftentimes the affordable housing projects do include public amenities like playground spaces and so I, our, non, our nonprofit providers are intentional in trying to provide additional amenities such as childcare. Um, and so I think that they've demonstrated time and time again over various projects, the most recent one being the one on the campus of the old um, recreation department headquarters on Randolph Road. Um, that's gonna have several amenities um, available to the residents of that particular parcel. So I don't think this, dissuades those organizations and I think hopefully they've heard us loud and clear that we want that to be the intent as well. Uh, thank you for those comments Councilmember Albernaz because I was going to uh, echo them as well uh, that our nonprofit providers um, who do this work who build the deeply affordable housing um, are expressing caution uh, and they only do so because their focus is on deeply affordable housing and as Councilmember Albernaz noted all of these organizations create holistic communities they have childcare they have labs uh, computer labs uh, workplace centers uh, and depending on their location they can work in commercial as well uh, and uh, I'm gonna listen to them and uh, stick with the original uh, committee recommendation but appreciate Councilmember Sales and Jawando and uh, want to state to um, the District 5 Councilmember, Councilmember Mink, uh, let's work on a ZTA to encourage more commercial, non-residential in East County.
Absolutely. I think you'd get uh, unanimous support from this council. Uh, and the best way to do that is when we take up the Fairland Briggs Cheney plan later this year. There's going to be a public hearing on September 27th. And I look forward to doing a deep dive at committee and at full council to get East County the amenities that they rightfully deserve. So look forward to working with you and all of our colleagues on that. Uh, so uh, colleagues before us is uh, an amendment to the ZTA. All those in favor of the Juwando Sales Amendment, raise your hand. Um, all those opposed, the amendment fails. We have a ZTA uh, before us. Uh, and not hearing any other comments, um, Madam Clerk, let's call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Dewando? Yes. Councilmember Dewando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Uh, next item is SRA 2301, Administrative Subdivision, Mixed Use Housing Community. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Vice President Friedson for a PHP committee report. Yes, colleagues, no, this, the SRA is just required to accompany a ZTA in the case of a subdivision being required. Uh, so, it, you know, the committee recommendation is to adopt it. It aligns uh, identically uh, with the committee recommendation to the ZTA, unless I've missed any technical pieces, Ms. Nadu? Uh, the only thing I was going to add, that the only thing that changes in the SRA will be the name change. Yes, so the name changed because we adopted as part of the committee recommendation to mixed income from mixed use housing community will be uh, included. So with that, I'll yield back to you. Very good. Not seeing any comments, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Councilmember Lutke? Yes. Councilmember Lutke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Duwando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Oops. Councilmember Balcom? <laughs> Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you, and thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Good timing. Thank you, Mr. Nadu. Uh, thank you to our planning staff. So we are now going to return to our regularly scheduled broadcast um, and resume consideration of Bill 1523, Landlord-Tenant Relations, Anti-Rent Gouging Protections. And we left off with a conversation and consideration on an amendment to an amendment that I had introduced regarding uh, banking. Uh, and Councilmember Stewart introduced. Uh, an amendment that would allow for new leases uh, to be included in the uh, restrictions. And so uh, I'll turn it back over to Ms. McCartney Green, although I think um, you had some comments you wanted. I welcome people to get back into the queue um, from the conversation. Um, Ms. McCartney Green, Anything I left off or anything that has transpired in the last two and a half hours? <laughs> no, I'm just not sure if we want to restate the motion or if everyone's clear on the motion. Just want to. Uh, if you want to restate it, I think we're clear, but it's okay. good to have on the record. Do you want me to state the main motion as well or just? Yes, please. Or both? Okay. 
And so as provided earlier, uh, Council Vice President, Council President uh, Glass amendment is to one, define the word uh, banked amount, uh, which means a dollar amount of an annual rent increase allowance that a landlord did not use to increase the rent for a regulated unit. In addition to that, there's a provision that says um, upon lease renewal, a landlord must not increase the rent of a regulated unit uh, to an amount greater than the base rent plus the rent allowance allowed under section 2957. In addition to that, Council Member Stewart uh, made an amendment uh, to include not only loose lease renewal, but to also include new leases as well, um, plus any bank amount not to exceed 10% as a cap. And so that's what I have as the amendment on the floor. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Albernos. Okay, thanks, sorry, getting my bearings straight. So the 10% cap, and Council Member Stewart, you, you, you mentioned where the 10% came from, you know, just double digits, but just your gut, you know, sort of a compromise, you know, meaning somewhere in the middle. Um, and I hear the understandable concern um, and we very much needing our state partners to step up and enact the legislation that the previous 19th council supported unanimously and I was part of that um, because just cause is a very significant issue. So I very much appreciate the intent. I guess my concern is is that um, based on the six versus the nine percent cap this on top of that um, would yet be another deterrent on top of everything else that we're looking at and so I'm, I'm cautious that, that this is just added a, a yet another death by the south thousandth cut here um, in potentially preventing and, and stagnating potential growth but I get the problem mm -hmm. so I, I would prefer that we focus our time and attention and I will be doing this personally and advocating at the state level for the just cause version of this where which I think will address the concerns that you've raised in a way that is that is even more holistic than the cap that you have proposed here before us today. Um, I did prefer that these both be separate but because it looked like it might pass <laughs> um, as a joint I felt the need to chime in now um, but I very much respect the place you're coming from in, in, in proposing it. Uh, thank you. Not seeing any other speakers. There is an amendment uh, on the table. All those in favor of uh, Councilmember Stewart's amendment, raise your hand. Uh, all those opposed? And that passes. Uh, so uh, with the adoption of that amendment, I would like to make an amendment to my amendment. Um, and uh, that amendment would adopt some of the policies that uh, the District of Columbia has used, recognizing that the purpose here is to protect renters uh, and also as we protect them and support them in staying in their units as long as they would like, which is the goal, um, that we take, uh, accommodate for adjustments should they leave after a long period of time. And as I noted um, before, what the District of Columbia does is uh, offer a 10% adjustment, not to the current renter, but when there is turnover, a 10% or more rent charge, a 10% more than the rent charge, so a 10% increase. Uh, if the former tenant has occupied the unit for 10 years or less, or and or a 20% rent increase for the next tenant, an adjustment, sorry, not rent increase, an adjustment if the tenant has occupied the unit for more than 10 years. And the purpose here, again, we want people to stay safely in their home. And while they're there, the rents will be subject to the rent cap. And when they vacate those units, there will be natural adjustment. And we're not saying that it should go to whatever the market would dictate but would give the landlord um, reasonable consideration due to market fluctuations and changes after someone has been there for a very long time. Um, so uh, I am amending my amendment to accommodate that um, and I deem it friendly. 
Um, so, conversation. Councilmember Jawando. Do I need a second? It? Uh, second. There you go. Seconded by Councilmember Lutke. Councilmember Jawando. I just first want to make sure I understand what, what has been done here based on the motion. The second, so we passed the amendment that was before us was Councilmember Glass's amendment, augmented by Councilmember Stewart's to add that language. Now we have a, a motion and a second for, and I scribbled it really quickly because I don't. Is it ten percent five years? M Ms. McCartney Green, can you re yeah. read it out for us? Sure. And so, from my understanding, is yeah. when a tenant uh, vacates a rental um, and they've been there for ten years or less, there's a ten percent that would be charged. Let me stop back up. Let me let me back up. And so. Yeah, there's an allowable 10% that would be charged on a tenant that's ten that's been here 10 years or less. Could. 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 Allowable. But I think allowable gets that. Yeah, okay. So 10 years or less, you could do 10, you could do up to a 10% increase in the transition when a tenant leaves. Correct. This is all about when a tenant leaves. And yes. then a 20% if it's 10 plus years. Yes. And that would be on top of the banking as well director Burton. just saying we need clarification for well it could there is under the previous amendment we just passed there is banking so i just i need to understand how that would operate yeah uh, could uh, or would, uh this take, would this would this be rescinding basically getting rid of what we just did I think it would be helpful just to, to be respectful to yeah. uh, Council President Class. Council With President Class, tenants, how yeah. did you envision inserting that into the amendment now as amended? Well, so the rent banking, uh, I think as we've now amended it, what uh, refresh us as to what the rent banking guidelines are now that we have Councilmember Stewart's uh, uh, amendment. Yeah, so we've defined it banking. To new leases, right? I'm sorry. Go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, we've defined banking, and so we talk about that dollar amount that's going to be applied um, if the landlord does not use it for the regular unit. We've also said that it would apply during a lease renewal or during a new lease, and so those are circumstances of where banking would be applicable. And this is the category of a new lease what we're talking about right now. Yes. So, so my understanding, unless I just want to understand the intent, so you could, you could. Under the current, what's already before us and passed, you could you have up to 10% when there's a new lease, which is a form of vacancy control that was embedded into the last thing. If there was banking. If there was banking, right, yeah. So would this be on top of the banking? That's what I'm trying to understand. Is that your intent? So whatever is banked, this would limit that use. It is quite possible that uh, a, a, a landlord could bank beyond Right, and so this limits that scope. So you, but you couldn't do. So if you say you banked under the scenario that we talked about, you have someone they leave. There was some banking done. There's a new, there's a new tenant comes in. So according to the amendment that we just adopted, and this is what I was asking for, uh, for for the the conversation, it caps at ten percent. Right. So this allows for up to twenty percent, if. A tenant has been there for more than 10 years. It's, it's added there to what we just did. Correct. Yeah, it's on top of that. So it's added there. Okay. Yeah. It, it is not undermining that at all. It is it is adding to it, recognizing that uh, that tenants, we want them to be there for as long as they would like, uh, and that there are changes in the marketplace. Sure. Do, do you mind if I read what our common understanding is? Yes, so please. This, this would be for the amendment as amended, uh, A3, to make this as simple as possible, any banked amount not to exceed, and pardon my, pardon my you know, quick language, not to exceed 10% for a tenancy of fewer zero or one to 10 years. Few, fewer than 10 years. Fewer, sorry, thank you, fewer than 10 years, and not to exceed 20%, for a uh, tenancy of more than 10 years. That's correct. And it's simply adding right. that 20% for more than 10 years to what we've already agreed to. Yeah. That okay. is the only change here. I appreciate that. So now that we understand, that was my first thing. Now I'll speak to the merits of it. Uh, um, but I just want to understand it first. So 
the in, initial the initial reaction here is that we, under what we've already the amendments we previously previously passed, you can already increase up to six percent year to year while that long term tenant. Right again, and then there's a lot of reasons. I don't want to assume that we want every, you know we want people to be stable in housing, whether that's rental housing, or home ownership, or con, you know whatever, and we want to encourage pathways into whichever type of stable housing. A lot of our residents rent, um, so there will be some market impact while that long-term tenant, ten to twenty years, is there. You'll be able to increase up to six percent. You'll be able to apply for a fair return in years if inflation's higher. If you have a capital expense, so the rent will be increasing. There will be market factors already increasing the rent I, that are factored into the landlord or the owner of the property's ability to maintain and make a profit. I don't understand the rationale of allowing a twenty percent increase, for example, if someone's in the you know in their eleventh year leaves. And the rent has been increased three percent every year for ten years, you know. So it's you know, for example, and kept up with inflation. Why there would need to be a one-time fee of twenty percent? Can you talk to me, Director Burton? Maybe that maybe I'm missing something, but I just don't understand in the transition why that would be required. So, um, as and please correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand the amendment, this, if worded this way, it would not just be at the end of a tenancy. It could be at any point in a tenancy. Um, so there's not, as currently uh, uh, proposed, not a restriction on using this at the end of a tenancy. So you could have a tenant who had been in a unit for 20 years and was continuing in the unit, and if the, the landlord had saved up the the delta between what was allowed and what they charged for you know given this 20 percent it's probably a pretty pretty long time then they could charge that tenant in the middle of their tenancy or at the end of their tenancy that 20 percent increase mm -hmm. i want to clarify that is not in the vacancy, middle upon vacancy is upon when this vacancy would, when this so we would need to add do you okay. yeah my understanding of the intent was upon vacancy so that yeah. would need because the the current and tell me if I'm wrong. The current bill, as uh, sorry, the current amendment as amended, does not have a provision for when to use the banking. It can be used during or after a tenancy, and so we would need to make an addition to get to that at the end of a tenancy. Right. Well, this uh, I don't want to. I'll, I'll Councilmember join up before. I appreciate it. So that aside, that's an issue. You've raised a, a different issue from what I've said which I do, is an issue, you know, when you do it. But I'm still trying to get to the answer of why is why would that, that seems exorbitant to me. Like, I don't understand why if someone stayed in an apartment for 11 years and was getting their rent increased every year, whatever the, you know, with the, under the cap, that in that 11th year they decide to move, they buy a home, they do something, that they move out of the area, that the next person, that the option to, would be able to go, take that rent from whatever it's at at that day up 20 percent, which is what I understand this would allow. Why is that? Why? Why is? Why is? What's DC? Because you came from DC. I'm just trying to understand what the rationale of that is. So, um, I will, per the question, I will answer based on what DC does, and uh, you know, not try to put words in your mouth. Uh, yeah, and I'm asking about DC because sure, sure. it was referred to as a policy in DC. To me, it just seems like a way to dramatically increase the, the number. Sure. You know. So based on having sat through many hearings uh, that where DC was working on amending this, uh, they had, as I previously mentioned, they used to have a 10 percent and a 30 percent, and they amended it to a 10 to 20. And the rationale from the, uh, from the landlord community uh, in pushing for that was that the longer a tenancy occurs, um, the higher a turnover cost will be. So if you've been in a unit for sure. 20 years, yeah. you're you going. Like, if you've been in a unit yeah. for one year, you're probably just going to need to do some vacuuming, a little touch up. If you've been in there several years, probably carpet and paint and some other stuff. If you've been there 20 years, they're probably going to you know get you new appliances and stuff like that. And so there are their rationale uh, and the rationale for the council members from what they said who voted for it was the argument about 
the um, turnover costs. Um, but wouldn't that be captured in fair return the other things? That, that was those who opposed it said that if that was an issue, you could apply for a fair return, or in their case, you know, a hardship petition, um, instead of waiting 20 years to get that increase. And so those were the kind of the two sides Got on it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just wrap up. I know others have comments. I, I, I think that I was already hard pressed at the 10. I just, 20 seems unconscionable, so I, I can't support that. Thank you. So let me uh, just address the, the questions that Councilmember Jawando made. Um, and the point of, uh, the, the point that you made about landlords being able to increase rent year over year, um, quite frankly, that was my concern with vacancy control. Because without this outlet, it encourages landlords to increase the rent as much as they can within that CPI plus three every year. And the point of the banking was to encourage good behavior. It was to encourage the smallest rent possible, knowing they could save that difference for when they need it when there's turnover, to do all the things that Director Bruton just stated. The cost of doing business, making sure the apartment is nice, and quite frankly, there might have been some changes in the community to accommodate that. And so the argument w works both ways. If we are going to have these controls, we need the offset, uh, because otherwise this is going to, in my opinion, require landlords to increase as much as they can without that limit. Uh, within the limit because they have no other mechanism to recoup any costs of doing business. And so if we want to have vacancy control uh, as we've now adopted, uh, there needs to be another outlet and that's what this is. Uh, Council Member Ludke. Thank you. I just want to go back to something we discussed during the last section because at the outset of this discussion, uh, and when Council Member Joanna was asking questions for clarification, some things got a little jumbled there. Um, and that was my point that I made earlier, and you all agreed to, and, and everybody's voted on that prior thing. But the rent banking ends when the tenant leaves and starts afresh with a new tenant. You're not carrying over the banked amount, correct? No. Because earlier you said that was right. And now I don't feel like it is. So I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the, in t the legislative intent of the original amendment from Council President right. Glass was for it to end at the end of each tenancy. As far as I understand from Council Member Stewart, her legislative intent is that over. it will carry over with the unit not, and not be particular to the tenancy. Is that correct? That is correct. And so it addresses the concern that Council President Glass raised that there is then money in order for uh, the, to go towards a new lease, that they can use that banked amount. Yes. In full or is that capped based on the amendment that you adopted? It's capped at 10% based on the amendment we Re had adopted. Regardless of the length of the tenancy. Yes. Right. right. And that's the problem and that's what this amendment is seeking to cure to give additional flexibility beyond what, you know, if 10% is the cap and 10% is what DC uses at the 10 year or less threshold to allow for that other threshold to be added to it. Back to you, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, Council Member Mink. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to note that there are a, a couple goals of vacancy control. Um, one of them is, of course, that we don't want to incentivize evictions. Um, and the other is to help preserve affordable housing in the county and help to keep costs low so that we're not pricing out uh, an entire income level of people and, and, and displacing them. So, you know, what we've seen uh, again, some, some of the research proven results that we've seen is when there is vacancy control, that that does help to keep rents affordable. When there is vacancy decontrol in markets that have rent control but have vacancy decontrol, what we see is that the rates there, again, in vacancy um, tend to go back to or near market rate, um, and those rates end up being comparable to other, you know, elevated elevated uh, uh, rents in the market, in the wider market. So 
Uh, you know, we saw that in you know uh, Berkeley versus the Bay Area when they had vacancy uh, control and then vacancy decontrol, and they rapidly, you know, their prices uh, came up to be un unaffordable again. But there's there's numerous examples of that, um, and so again, we're looking to have balance here. Ten percent, as Councilmember uh, Jawanda noted, that was a that was a stretch. <laughs> That's a stretch for me, but. Um, but I think that it's, uh, it, I'm comfortable with the compromise. 20% uh, does not feel necessary to, I mean, I, I don't see that it is necessary because again, we have, uh, we have uh, 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 fair, what am I saying? Fair? Return. Return, thank you. Um, yeah, we have fair returns. So um, the, I understand that there may be like an emotional component to, to being able to say that that 20% is waiting for you there, but in a practical sense, if they need to make additional invest investments, they have the fair returns, they're gonna have the, the additional 10%. Um, I, and I also don't want to um, have the incentives change for landlords to uh, evict or push out tenants after they hit that 10 year mark. We want people to stay in housing um, uh, in perpetuity for as long as they want to. We know all about the benefits of housing stability for people. Uh, and I think that there is also an enormous downside in having uh, incentives increase to evict people the longer they stay. I yield. Councilmember Balcom. Uh, thank you. So I just want to clarify. So we're talking about, um, even with the 20%, we're talking about uh, using the banked amounts, correct? So it's not it's not just a flat 20%. It's the, the banked amount up to a cap of 20%, correct? That is correct. Okay. It, I can add that in DC, it is an automatic 10 or 20% yeah. regardless of banking. And as you correctly stated, uh, it would be only it would be limited by what you charged underneath what you were allowed to charge. Right. So I think that that, that to me that's an important point because um, to Councilmember Jawando's perspective, um, which is a good point of if a tenant is raising the rent, if a landlord is raising the rents every year, why would they need to raise the rent 10% or 20% later, right? But the point is that um, they're not raising the rents every year up until the allowable amount. So if it's 3% plus CPI, um, the only way they're ever going to get to 10% or 20% is that they've banked that, which means that they haven't increased the rent as high as they could have. Um, so I think that that's, um, that, you know, that's an important point. And so if you, you know, realistically, um, it, to get to 10%, that's you know if they if they banked 2% a year for for five years or 1% a year for 10 years, I think it's going to be um, uh, uh, unusual uh, if somebody does raise their rents 20% because that means they've banked 20%. I think I think that's important to note. And um, as for the the fair uh, the fair return. Um, I go back to the committee meeting when we talked about fair return, and um, we, we're we're relying on seeing how that's going to work. And and I feel like um, when we talk about the uh, burden, the capacity of staff, and how fair returns going to, I I don't think that uh, filing for fair return, if that's even the correct verb. Um, is the panacea because I, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's going to be an easy, equitable process. So um, I don't, I, I'm not, well, I'm not concerned about the 20%, I, I'm, but that's not a surprise, but, um, but I don't think that we're going to get to 20% on very many, um, in very many places. And if we do, that means that the landlord has not charged an increase that, that he or she has been allowed to do for many, many years. So that's my take on that. Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad uh, Councilmember Balcom raised the issue of, you know, if you were raising to the maximum amount, why would you need to, to do this? I think you have answered that well. The whole point here is that you haven't raised it to the maximum amount. In fact, it could be 
lots of examples of not raising the rent at all for a significant period of time with the same tenant there for you know 10 15 years you have a good tenant there's a good relationship you don't raise the rent you don't have a lot of costs you know everything is copacetic then when that uh, uh, resident moves out there are a lot of improvements that need uh, that need to be made and the and the and the uh, landlord raises the rent to you know match where the the market uh, is so I, I think that was fleshed out I think there are a couple points here I, I because of the way that this has been amended as was noted earlier we are not differentiating from an existing tenant and a new tenant and that's a policy decision but that is a major policy decision and originally bill 1523 was protecting residents this protects units which is very different this is this is a unit restriction mm -hmm. and that is a very different standard and there are a lot of dynamics related to restrictions placed on a unit and there are positive policy outcomes that come from that and councilmember mick noted this uh, quite a bit, but there are also negative ones that come from it uh, as well. The costs of maintaining a unit where somebody is in the unit versus finding a new tenant is is different. Th those are different standards, and we have now, from a public policy perspective, not viewed them any differently. So yes, this is an effective tool to artificially restrict housing stock but that is going to have consequences because you know ultimately something has to give at some point and so either someone's going to choose not to do something or they're going to choose to do something which the something and I think this is what council president glass was speaking to earlier is going to be to try to get as much rental income increases on an annualized basis as possible which is a negative outcome it had always been my approach to this and the reason why i did not support banking in the original bill and felt strongly about that and pushed back when it was requested the goal here shouldn't be to bank the amount of rent over time and then charge a significant amount to an individual person at a given time we're trying to create stability that's that's the goal and with this provision we're, we're creating a lower cost for the unit over time but not necessarily stability at all in fact the unintended consequence of this provision that is before us whether we take up councilmember glasses uh, amendment or not is potentially instability now it's instability to a cap and i understand the interest in having a cap and i respect the reason why that was put forward but it is an incentive to increase the rent on a regular annual basis because there's no point at which you can say, listen, I have a good tenant, I don't wanna mess that up. You know, it's a good relationship, they're treating the property well, we, you know, they're communicative, we, 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 things are working out, I don't have a lot of costs of turnover, no vacancy, et cetera. And then I will make up any losses on that at the turnover, at, at the point at which they're, they, they wanna you know, move out. At this point, you don't have that benefit at the end of the relationship and so the likelihood is you're going to raise the rent even if it's a good tenant because there's no differentiation and so i, I just I, I don't know of a way to address that because we've already taken up the prior proposal and it treats these two things the same but i think it's important to recognize that we are now treating an individual tenant and the instability that a significant rent increase causes to a to a tenant that is in a home the exact same as a new tenant. And I personally don't believe those two things are the same. The instability that a significant rent increase to an existing tenant it requires a protection. The new tenant requires us as county government to build enough housing to make the market work for people, to build enough affordable housing, to build to add to the to, to the to the supply the relationship between a tenant and a, and, and a landlord when the tenant lives in the home is significantly stacked against the tenant that's where this protection originally was intended to to help when a tenant is looking for a unit and is not living in that home at that particular time that is a much more balanced not perfectly balanced because we don't have enough housing 
but is a much more balanced power dynamic because there are other options to go to other buildings, to work with other landlords, to find another unit. If we had enough units, that would be completely equal. In fact, if we had more units than we had need for those units, the power would be with the tenant, not with the landlord. So I just, I think it's important to, 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 to call that out. I, I appreciate where this is going, but there is a real challenge here that we are now treating these two dynamics exactly the same, and I find them to be quite different. Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you. Um, Director Burton, you provided the context for the decision making from the district's perspective, which is super helpful. Thank you for that. But from your perspective, in practical terms, you hear us struggling with this. What's your take? Um, I want to be careful not to opine, uh, you know, in favor of one side or the other. Um, I think I think I will say that I think if folks vote, for, if the council member council votes for council member Glass's uh, amendment, that we every, that you all need to clarify the issue of his vision of at the end of tenancy versus uh, during tenancy um, because currently it's allowable under tenancy and I don't think Councilmember Glass wants to allow it to 20 percent during tenancy and so we would need to make that kind of clarification. Um, I think most often just looking at Sorry, I'm not trying to mess anybody up or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, I, what I just said is the question therein is a difficult one because according to the new amendment, tenancy never ends. It is ongoing from one tenant to the other. It Cor is a continuum. Correct. Correct. Um, and so based on the majority of landlords that I have that I've dealt with over time, and this is, you know, small landlords to corporate landlords and they have very different considerations, um, I think most folks would use their banking, their banked rents intermittently over time to even things out uh, when they have, you know, because there'll be highs and lows uh, with, with, uh, with the CPI. And for times when CPI is lower, folks will probably, just based on my experience, will probably use it during those low times. They may not raise it all the way during times when CPI is high and then bank those savings, those dollar savings to add when, on the times when CPI is low. And I think that's the most likely to happen. That said, I have encountered many landlords, usually they're smaller landlords, not larger landlords, who will allow a uh, stereotypical elderly woman uh, or elderly man to, uh, who's a good tenant, who's on a fixed income, to go for a long time without a significant increase. And I, it, you could see in those cases that they would bank the full allowable 10 or the full allowable 20 and look to get that when they uh, uh, rent to a new tenant. And so there, you know, like both perspectives are persuasive. Council member, I mean, sorry, council president, uh, Glass um, is, in, in, a, in a way, it, it, he's trying to, uh, to to make it easier for landlords who are willing to charge less for a longer period of time to not suffer financially and to be able to do that for a longer period of time. Um, that said, as Councilmember Joando and others have, have n noted, 20% is still 20%. Um, and so, you know, like that affects the affordability of the unit going forward. And so, you know, I hope I've kind of given a notion of the way these different things can play out, the different considerations. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think, um, you know, if somebody's been in a place for over 10 years, then it is very likely that the appliances will need to be replaced. Um, you know, just for sheer purposes of wanting to have a working apartment for the next person or family that comes in. And so, understandably, we've been looking at this, as we should, from the affordability standpoint of the renter, but what would the costs be, generally speaking, to renovate a unit? And I know there's a wide range, depends on whether it's, uh, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, but is there an industry standard or something that we have found to be 
an equation that property owners typically use in order to be able to improve the quality of an apartment to be able to attract a new tenant but also ensure the quality of life for that tenant remains high um, I never like to go on beyond my experience level I know that there are theoretical uh, standards for things based on age I that gets beyond my level of like in-depth experience so I don't want to be uh, on that and also we have to realize that the landlords of different size calculate these things in different ways the more units you have to spread the costs of turnover over time if you have a 400 unit building and you have a 20 year turnover that's going to have significantly less impact on you because costs have been spread over because you've had a bunch of units that have turned over on an annual basis um, and you've gotten your increase. The, uh, for smaller landlords, the calculation is very different if you have, say, a single family house or, you know, or, or a, you know like a four, four uh, uh, apartment flat. Um, and we all know that if you're replacing a kitchen, uh, replacing a kitchen can run fifteen twenty thousand um, dollars but at the same time you put your a landlord is putting out that money they're not uh, you know, when they're getting a significant rent increase they're getting paid back for that investment over time and we also need to remember that part of being a, a, a good landlord and running a, a rental property is um, uh, saving for a replacement reserve so part of your calculations in doing your rent is putting aside money for not only major expenses like say your air conditioner or your boiler or something but also you know like usually for carpet or paint or something like that most industry standards usually like three to five years a lot of them a lot of folks don't do that but you're supposed to be saving incrementally over time um, and so it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that as far as putting aside some of your rent but then also future rent helps take care of some of the turnover costs too Okay, um, I think, and I appreciate Councilmember Friedson's um, sort of summary of, of kind of what exactly we just did in the previous amendment. And I think we've all agreed that we don't want to disincentivize property owners from investing in their properties. That's also a problem in of itself. Um, and so I think that this is a reasonable measure um, to help ensure that the quality of a unit remains quality. And so I, I'm going to support the amendment. Uh, and Director Britton, I appreciate the, the balancing act, which I think you successfully um, uh, performed in answering uh, Councilmember Albernaz's questions. But to the point that was raised before, if a landlord is able to bank enough for the 20%, that means they were really, really good to their tenant, as you noted. I think so many people want their tenants to stay there for as long as possible and if you have someone who's been there for more than 10 years, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that apartment when there's turnover in order for the next tenant to live in a high quality unit. And because you treated that long term tenant so well, there are just costs that are associated with it. And this is what this proposes to, to fix. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. I respect everybody's comments. I think we're over complicating this and we haven't even got into the rehab and substantial new <laughs> renovation exemption uh, where this, this issue is going to be brought up again. Uh, listen, I, I heard the pros and cons. I, I'm not going to vote for the amendment. I'm ready to move on. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This is really, and it, 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 as much as we thought we had think, uh, uh, heard all the complex issues associated, this um, it gave us a whole new complex. Can you explain, please, Scott, how the fair return would work on this? So, uh, the fair return in general? Yeah, uh, on, on, uh, is associated with this. I mean, if somebody said, you know, I, I uh, they didn't raise it all along, which is, an, is what we want. We want somebody to, to, if they could raise it six, only raise it three or whatever it is. I mean, to raise it only what they need to raise it to, to keep the uh, person in the, in the unit. 
but then at the end of the five years, ten years, whatever the number is, then then uh, how does a fair return kick into that? I would say that speaking to Council President Glass's amendment, allowing the twenty percent or even the ten percent, as compared to say you know you you weren't allowed to bank anything, the more banking that you allow, it is an alternative to filing a fair return petition. And so if you come to a place because you have not charged the maximum allowed each year, right. where you're not making, uh, your, your, your net operating income is not what it it, it w would allow you to file a fair return petition. You would have this banked rent that you could that you could access on the existing or new tenancy instead of doing a fair return petition. And so it is just in basic terms. It's it's a different way to access an extraordinary rent increase above what would be allowed under the standard annual limit. I, I can, I, you know, as much as I appreciate someone to be able to be able to do this, a landlord, I'm also concerned when it becomes um, too expensive for that landlord to keep that tenant in that apartment, because at some point, if you can, you're not, you know, you're raising three percent, you're raising, but you could raise the next tenant twenty percent or or whatever the number is. Why? Why would you? Why would you not entice that that tenant that's in there today to leave? I mean, you can get twenty percent versus the three it's and get closer to the market. It's only after ten years, according ten to the mayor. Sorry, whatever. But yeah. I, to me, that's a concern. That 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 is one of uh, referring to the Olo report. That is one of the concerns in allowing vacancy decontrol, and any even uh, the amendment by Council Member Stewart, as it stands, is a form of vacancy decontrol. And the more, just referring to the Olo report, uh, every because everybody seems to you know like value the Olo report, uh, the more you allow vacancy decontrol. The 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 less it reduces the impact on rent of the rent stabilization on general how on the affordability of a unit, as you all said, not on the affordability for the individual tenant, but on the affordability for the unit. Which and I and I appreciated that. I think that we have changed from the protecting the the um, the tenant to protecting the unit, and there is a big difference for that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyhow, thank you, Mr. President. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I appreciate the line of questioning. So I, I did some math, which is always dangerous, but I wrote it down. If you're paying three thousand a month today, and your rent is increased four four percent each year, that's a hundred and twenty dollars per year. You do one hundred and twenty dollars. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah, but it's $120 increase per month per year, yeah, 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 yeah. is my point. Yeah. So if you multiply that over 12 years, that's $1,440. So that means in the 12th year, your the rent that was $3,000 for a tenant was is now $4,440. You you could have banked 2% each year potentially, you know, theoretically depending on what inflation is, but this is just for the exercise, which then in the twelfth year, you could say bye bye, and raise the rent twenty percent from four thousand four hundred and forty, and that would be eight hundred eighty-eight more dollars. And the rent in the twelfth year of a unit that was three thousand dollars today, twelve years from now, could be five thousand three hundred twenty-eight dollars under this amendment. I, the incentive here to council member. Uh, Catch's point. Um, this is that's not creating the right incentive structure. Um, I'm already concerned because again, we're assuming that the six percent compromise that Councilmember Fani Gonzalez and, and and I and the committee and others have agreed to 
was already a compromise because that's a high number for some of us. And the average rent increase is two to three percent over the last 40 years. And people are doing just fine, making a lot of money. There's the vacancies, rates are low, people are renting. So I just think that we have to understand these are not like theoretical numbers. Um, that That's a significant increase, not even getting to the fair return part, which you just talked about. So I just want people to understand in real numbers what this amendment could allow, and I just gave you a scenario. Thank you. Do you mind if I add a little thing real quick? Please. To, to uh, a follow-on to Councilmember Katz's question that sort of gets at what you were saying. Um, we're talking about how um, uh, rent banking adds some um, uh, cushion, you know, if, if the if the uh, that the prop if the property owner chooses not to um, uh, take the full rent amount. Uh, one thing that I should have mentioned earlier, and it's an important thing to remember, is that the CPI part of that is rental. It's a basket of goods, um, you know, wages, services, and rental is in there as well as utilities. And so I did mention earlier there's a little lag in the CPI because you may get a utility increase one year and the CPI may not pick it up until the year after that, but you're allowing CPI plus three. And so you've already allowed f annually for 3% over the government's tracking of <coughs> increased costs. And so that, in addition to the banking and the fair return, um, as well as the capital improvement, you have several different ways that allow a landlord to, get, to, to increase rents in different ways to get at cost overages that are over time or that are unexpected. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Um. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that. And um, I, yeah, I, I share the concern expressed by um, Councilmember Strawando and Katz and, and others. Um, I, I understand the, the intention and I understand and respect the intention. Um, I have my, my feeling is that it doesn't seem necessary. And uh, the risk is that we're going to see a lot of evictions in people's 11th year of tenancy. And uh, so that does not seem like a, a worthwhile or necessary trade off. Um, I just wanted to ask if before this goes to vote, it does sound like we're all talking about it, like this is just for vacancy, and I just want to make sure that the language that we vote on is just for vacancy, if that is the intent, and if it's not the intent, then if we could just have that clarified. My understanding, this is for vacancy, this is upon a vacancy that this would occur. That's correct. Thank you. It, uh, it's I'm sorry. Mr. Bruton, did you have a question? I have a question too. Um, uh, do you mean that the banking would only be able to be used at vacancy? Or that, because, yeah, because yeah. that was the question I had earlier. Would during or, during or it was during yeah. or after? Yeah. And so we would need some clarification. So is it the, the up to ten percent is allowed during the tenancy? Can I can I say my understanding of the of the bill, and then you tell me if it's right? Thanks. Okay. So, um, so my understanding is, or sorry, of the, the of the amendment is that this is adding on to all of the pieces that we have just discussed, um, adding on that w when a tenant vacates then if that tenant had been there for 10 years or less, um, the landlord can use banked points up to a 10% increase. If that tenant had been there over 10 years, um, then they can use up to, then you can use banked points to go up to a 20% increase in that period of of vacancy if it's been banked if it's been banked and quite right. frankly if the market can even bear it but yes that's correct okay thank you can I, I just, there is I'm thinking of the, in relation to the OLO report there is an issue if it's just during the tenancy because and this goes I think what Councilmember Jawando had asked earlier in a different context if the banking increases incrementally over time 
and you can only use it at vacancy, it will get increasingly to the benefit of the landlord to end a tenancy as banking grows. And so I would say that if the concern is to, you know, like to allow banking, but to also not encourage displacement, then we should try to find a way to allow the use of banking during tenancy to, like I said, to, you know, kind of even out between those years of high and low CPI, but to respect Council, Member, Council President sorry, uh, Glass's uh, t uh, amendment, maybe have it be somewhat different um, uh, if that is going to pass for uh, beyond the 10 percent, you know, like, we, yeah, sorry, I did. It's, it's hard to kind of... Thank you for making things clearer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, th I, yeah, I, mean, I would ag agree with that concern that we, we want to have parity between uh, renewals and new leases, so um, this would be an, an added concern there, especially if with such a large differ differential. Um, and I think that as we had it and with the previous amendment that we had uh, a balance that I was comfortable with. Thank you. Vice President Friesen. You know, I was going to ask for a simple clarification. The, the, the amended version prior to the motion treated a lease renewal and an existing tenancy exactly the same. There is no difference based on what has been approved by the body between somebody who's in an existing lease and somebody who is seeking a new lease. Literally no difference whatsoever at all. There is now a banking provision, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but there is now a banking provision that applies to everybody. Whether you are a new tenant starting a new lease, you're doing a lease renewal on an existing tenancy, you have, as a landlord, the ability to bank unused increase above 6% up to 10% to increase the to, to increase the rent on a tenant. That can be done once a year with 90 days notice. If, if the lease ends and there is a new lease, you also can increase up to 6% with any banking added up to 10%. So 6% is the standard. If you hadn't used all of your 3% uh, plus CPI at the 6% cap, any banked amount over any period of time, up to 10% until you've exhausted the, the banked amount, you could, you could start a new lease and a new tenancy above the prior lease at no more than 10%. But up to that point, so there's literally no difference. That's what was before. I think uh, to, to go along with something you said earlier, the the banking would run with the unit, not with the individual. Correct. Tenant. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I just I just want to make sure. the 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 amendment, if we're going to amend this, it has to be a new provision. You know, it could be part of the same amendment, but it has to be like new lines. So I, I just I, I think it's important. You know. We, we vote on language, not intent. So what's the language that we're going to add to the amendment to differentiate a new lease for this banking standard? Because we can't... We, we, amending lines 36 to 40, as we had previously, and adding this new standard would not accomplish what you've heard the intent of the mover of the motion. So we need new language to be suggested. And I would just note, wasn't a fan of banking, <laughs> don't think we should have done banking, You know, thought that we should find a point at which we didn't need banking because there weren't all these other concerns and, and questions. And I do think this is part of the concern that I have had all along that once you go to a low enough point, you have to make this incredibly complicated for it not to be incredibly disruptive. And I think this is a good, unfortunate example of that. But could, could, you, could you say out loud what the language would be 
for the motion that is before us right now based on the intent of the mover as you've heard it. Before I say that, I just want to make clear that right now what's amended is lease renewal and at the time of a new lease. Council Vice Council President Glass is specifically talking upon vacancy. And so I, I'm not going to put that in here, but I want you to keep in mind that this amendment is specifically for vacancy. And so looking at provision three, um, bottom of page seven, uh, it says any bank amount, and this is how it read, not to exceed 10% if the uh, tenant has lived in the, in, the, in the regulated unit for 10 years or less, or if the tenant has lived in the occupancy for 10 years or more, not to exceed 20%. That's the, and I'm sorry that looks a little bit fuzzy, but that's where that language would come into, into play. Yeah, I just want to clarify that that would include existing tenants and new tenants. No. Based on what you, I mean, this is if, this if, if you, you mentioned part three, which is any banked amount following that, right. which would be line 40 of the bill. I just want to make sure we're all understanding what we're voting on here because this has massive consequences for a lot of people. That is a subsection of part A. Part A, which is in general, except as provided under subsection B upon a lease renewal, and we add it. So that it's not just upon a lease renewal. No, it's upon vacancy. My understanding is vacancy is the, is the key terminology. All, all the councilors understand that, that this would apply upon a vacancy. So if you've lived in an apartment for more than 10 years and upon your 11th year of vacating that regulated unit, the landlord has the opportunity to increase the rent allowance up to 10%, the banked amount up to 10%. If it is more than that between the years of 11 to 20, they have the opp opportunity to increase that amount to 20%. 11 and up. 11 and up. But how does the legislative, la I just, I'm trying to understand, this is a subsection of the part above it that specifies the category that we're talking about. What and it would say, all, all would be included and then the banked amount would mean that the, the, I just, the initial amendment then would no longer allow for any banked amount for a lease renewal unless this was satisfied for a vacancy. I just want to make sure, because that's not how we would normally draft a bill. Do you mind if I ask a clarifying question of Council President Glass? Do you, um, the, the language is easy uh, to come up with if you intend the banking to only occur at, at uh, least turnover. Yes. Okay, so then that is what Ms. McCartney Green was saying, that the language would not only need to be changed to deal with the up to 10 years for 10% or the 11 you know, plus years for 20%, it would need to be changed so that it was a, a, a just on vacancy. Um, and so that would need, because this is a general provision that goes with a whole section, because this deals with your your allow uh, your ability to increase rent at all, and so we would need differentiation in here between because um, right now it's on lease renewal and a new lease to to increase the base rent, uh, and so we would need some differentiation that the banking the that the the vacancy upon vacancy would have to be added to A3, correct? Correct. As compared to A. So this is the point that I was trying to raise. Um, I, I will just note the original amendment, I just want to make sure I understand the intent. The original amendment was only to include re lease renewals. What has just been suggested after it's been amended is to exclude lease renewals and only be for vacancies. So I just want to make sure I can that make that's here and so understood, because that is a di that is different than what was originally, but before us, we're now eliminating lease renewals from banking and only using banking for new leases. Oh, based based on what was just said. Well, under the yeah, I just I, I just the amended make amendment gets us to where we are. Yeah, yeah. and the, the other way to do it would be, and I'm not 
the other way to do it would be to change the definition of a banked amount and to define when it can be banked in what circumstances. I just, I'll yield back. Is that the more straightforward way? We can create a section specifically on banking amount when it comes to vacancy. And so right now, that section A is general. And so if we're creating an exception to that general, we can do that as well as a subsequent. And so that could be, and I, I, we're pulling pieces of the legislation in here, so I don't want to say section B, but that could be a separate provision where we could parse that out separately. Upon vacancy, the terminology would apply where in terms of the 10%, if it's 10 years or less in the property, or 20%, that you're allowed to, to use for banking if it's uh, less than 20 years. Got it. Uh, and, and I'll note that there was some you know, back of the envelope math before, and the reality is all of that would be already allowed if the landlord raises, raises rents every year by what they're allowed. That would absolutely be allowed. It has nothing to do with banking. It has nothing to do with this provision. If a landlord wanted to do CPI plus three every year, that's the back of the envelope math. It's the same thing. Council Member Balcom. I'm sorry, I, I was just wondering why we couldn't do two separate sections. That seemed the easiest, but we're going to do that, right? Sorry. Very good. Council Member Albernos. Sure. Thanks. This is just 30,000 feet. I'm, I'm lost on, on some of this conversation. I'm doing the best that I can to keep pace, um, and I'm concerned about that. Um, and I know I'm not alone. So we have scheduled a work session in action today. We're doing the best we can. You all are doing a magnificent job of trying to keep pace with the conversation and providing some reasonable feedback. But we are, you are literally reading <laughs> uh, amendments as, as you understand them without us having the opportunity to see them and review them and process them. And that is a deep concern of mine. So. Um, as we and we're only on still on item five, I believe four four. So I just want to note for colleagues um, that we have to be very careful here. This is the most consequential piece of legislation that this council has passed in the last 20 years, full stop. And we got to get it right. <laughs> uh, not just the policy and the merits, but the actual language and the legal language that we're utilizing here because people need to understand on all sides what it is that we are proposing. So I just felt the need to mention that at this point, uh, and I will continue to do the best that I can to, to follow along the many, many bouncing balls at this point. Appreciate that. It is 4 o'clock. We're on item number 4. There are no other speakers for this amendment, uh, uh, and so let me ask, can we state what the amended, what the amendment is for the amended amendment. And so we have two options here, whether we're amending uh, provision number three or, and I understand that the council would need to see this obviously written, well, the alternative is to have a separate section that would specifically li list out uh, banking uh, upon vacancy. And so it would read any bank amount not to exceed 10% if a lease renewal, I'm sorry, not upon vacancy, and if the previous tenant living property for less than 10 years could bank up to, could ap apply up to 10%. Um, or if uh, any bank amount not to exceed 20% if Upon vacancy, the previous tenant lived in the property for 10 years or more. That's I don't know correct. if I can make that I, any clearer. No, but uh, that's the uh, being my amendment, that makes sense. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so, colleagues, that is the amendment before us. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? Amendment fails. So, we have an underlying amendment. Uh, before us, would you like to report out the once amended amendment that is before us? That is the original amendment with the Stewart amendment. That was voted on, right? I had that as 6 5. That's correct. Okay. 
Uh, just to re reiterate again, um, except as provided under subsection B, upon a lease renewal or a new lease, a landlord must not increase the rent of a regulated rental unit to an amount greater than one, the base rent, plus two, the rent increase allowance under subsection 2957, uh, plus any bank amount not to exceed 10%. Very good. Um, all those in favor of that uh, amendment? All those opposed? Okay, that amendment passes. So now we're on to a proposed amendment, which might be moot. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Stewart. No, I'm pulling my next two. Okay, very good. So item number five is no longer being introduced. Um, and then we go to item number six, and I'll turn it over to Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so in the packet at page, what page are we on? Page uh, nine, which is page 11 of your PDF. Um, it is item number six, and this is an amendment that would exempt uh, new construction built after January 1st, 2000. Um, and so that, and this is in place of what the, in the original draft said 15 years. And uh, I want to explain why I'm proposing the amendment. Um, so we have uh, plenty of new larger scale construction projects um, that are built since that time that are still managing financing because these are financed projects, not ones that are, you know, they're not paid for at the time that they're done. And these entities are still paying back financing. Um, sometimes those, happen by selling the property to a different company. That's commonplace practice in, in development and management of buildings. Um, but those buildings were constructed and built and financed based on existing laws at the time those projects were started. Um, and now a new system is going into place uh, that's going to impact how they maintain those units and whether they, whether they pursue future new projects, of course, as well. But we want to make sure we're capturing um, entities that, that would be in that financing uh, sweet spot. Please note that 77% of rental units in the county would not fall under this exemption. So this is a, a, a niche group of, of properties. So 77% um, of the rental units are in buildings that are older um, than the year 2000 and they would be still subjected to the rent stabilization um, if they aren't exempt in some other way or don't get a fair return waiver. And to be clear, as we've, everybody's talked repeatedly about the District of Columbia and their policies, um, DC also uses a date certain in place in its law. Um, of course, its date certain is almost as old as I am. Um, and I am really focused on doing one that makes sense based on the financial trajectory of uh, development projects um, and the time to pay back uh, and and uh, be consistent with that. So, and the reason that I've selected a date certain instead of a rolling date is simply um, we've already had multiple discussions here that have already been very complex, and that, as discussed, will require complexity in managing and compliance for for you, uh, for DHCA, and for everyone to understand. Um, by having a bright line uh, date in place, it makes it easy for everyone to ascertain and understand um, immediately. Um, so with that, Mr. President, I yield back. Uh, thank you. So there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you. So that was a good summary. Um, the District of Columbia, between 1990 and you were there for part of it, Scott, I believe, um, um, experienced a surge in development. Now, um, there were ebbs and flows. There were um, things that Mayor Williams did at the time. Um, and there was a lot of cleaning up that needed to be done of previous administrations. Um, there was a lot of credibility that was added back to the city, um, but housing experts I've spoken to in the District of Columbia have indicated that having the date certain was helpful in making sure that while rents were protected, and, and especially our most vulnerable populations, it did not 
stop the city from being able to have the renaissance that it had and the incredible buildings that it has been able to build um, in a lot of different communities, which has reaped tremendous benefits to the city, um, has brought in lots of additional tax revenue that they've been able to put to good use and in very productive ways. And so I think a date certain is clean, it is easy to follow, uh, and especially given the conversation we've had for the last four hours, um, I believe that would be well received just from a practical standpoint. And I also think that it would alleviate many of my concerns um, that the measures we are about to take are going to have a tremendously detrimental effect in growth and development moving forward. And so um, for those reasons, I support this. And I'll just underscore once again that it covers 77% of properties were built before 2000. Um, and we don't want to have, we're, we're all trying to prevent unintended consequences here. Um, and so that's why I think this measure is reasonable. It mirrors what's happened in the district. And uh, I, I, that's why I'm supporting it. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I, I have been leaning towards date certain for several, I guess, whenever the, the thought came up. But then uh, the idea for the, um, this is exemption six, for those of you who are following with a scorecard. Exemption seven is saying for less than 23 years. My concern for date certain is that that's forever. And that concerns me. It would be um, that forever somebody would not be under this legislation. And with the 23 years, it's rolling. It's, it's uh, someone could, could uh, finance and refinance and, and do what is necessary. And I understand that there's those in the, in the uh, land who are landlords who don't like that. They would much prefer to have a date certain. But I'm, I'm going to be supportive of 23 years rather than the date certain of 2000. Thank you. Okay, any other colleagues? Okay, not seeing any colleagues. Um, all those in support of this amendment, raise their hand. All those against? And that fails. Uh, next is an amendment I would like to uh, introduce, uh, and it uh, combines the goals of the previous amendment with the realities uh, that exist. Um, uh, you know, the amendment that Councilmember Ludke offered was to try and recognize that newer buildings built since 2000 um, are a little different and that we want to encourage growth and development. And I have said from, from the very beginning of this conversation, we need to continue building more housing. And what I would like to introduce is an amendment that would uh, exempt buildings over a 23 year period, which is the same period as of right now that Councilmember Ludke had uh, the time span that she intended to cover, uh, but it will be a moving time span. So for the a building that is built today will be protected for the next 23 years and those that are currently within the 23 year period uh, will eventually age out and be captured uh, by the rent stabilization. Uh, and so, uh, so I would like to make this motion. Uh, moved by Councilmember Katz. Uh, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad with as we move along, they actually getting more simple as far as <laughs> what they're actually doing. So just to refresh everyone's memory, the Home Act allowed for 10 years for new construction exemption. That would have been rolling by definite. We're using different terms, but it's the same thing. The anti-rent gouging bill was 15 years, which was the compromise we did in PHP. This is a proposal to lengthen that another eight years, uh, but still would be rolling. Uh, and that's why just 
amends that language. Um, I, I think we're heading in the right, you know, obviously, you know, Tacoma Park does five years, <laughs> just for context. Um, uh, and so there's a, there's a wide range of this. I think uh, we acknowledge that it needs to be a little more. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just note for colleagues um, is that if, for example, we started at 2005 on a rolling, that's the last year MPDUs were allowed to expire after 20 years. There's a policy reason for that to, to, to do that, which would be in the, after 2005, MPDUs were available, are now for 99 years. Um, so there is, I, I would just suggest um, that we consider splitting, I don't like to, I don't split any babies, I have four, but we don't split them, but, but consider maybe doing 20, uh, whatever, I'm sorry, 20, uh, that would be 18 years, sorry. So 18 years, so between 15 and between 23, because there's a policy reason of the MPDU change. That being said, I just wanted to flag that, I think this is, in the right zone of where we need, you know, a compromise. Again, I don't think it's required, but I wanted people to have that information. So, thank you, Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you. Uh, just a question. So, for the properties that do fall into the category that Councilmember Lukey mentioned, and that that is a real thing, um, people who refinance and they did it based on the rules of yesterday, not the rules moving forward. Will they be eligible to apply? For uh, to you guys for the hardship or um, or not? Uh, yeah, for for the fair return petition and capital improvement petition, all of those things. Um, I would just add that the little context, um, the rolling exemption, uh, wherever they are across the country, are intended to allow uh, initial investors and loans, say Fannie, Freddie, uh, as well as equity investors, to be paid back. Um, on their initial investment before the property uh, goes under rent stabilization. And then, so it, it, it's to not impact the incentives to build new construction. And so it is by year 15, you're on your second, maybe third owner. By year 23, you're on past that. Um, and those prior, those owners that come after the first can figure that in to what they're what they're paying for the property. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Um, I just think we need to have a correction. When we have this in PHP, we talked about new construction. Uh, it was a mistake. It's a typo. Let's just say it's a typo. So this needs to be set, this needs to say new construction instead of units offered for rent for less than you know, it needs to say new construction. So making that absolutely clear here. Um, second of all, I, uh, Council Member Dewand already mentioned this. Um, I said from the very beginning, I will not go beyond 15 years, ever. And then I, ha I pushed for an amendment, which is in coming up, that will have make this, that I was making the exception for MPDU uh, projects um, that were in buildings that had at least 25% MPDU. So if this passes from Council President Glass and just kind of withdraw my amendment, um, with all that said, I am going to support Council President Glass with the edit that I just made that it has to be only for new constructions, period. Moving on. Uh, thank you, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Uh, you are correct that this needs to uh, be amended to include new construction. Ms. McCartney Green is uh, nodding there, and that was the intention. That is correct. Not seeing any comments. Uh, all those in favor of this amendment extending, uh, uh, offering uh, rent for uh, for the 23-year grace period for new construction. All those against? That's nine to two. This passes. Okay, I will turn it over to Councilmember Ludke for the next amendment. We're up to lucky number eight now, yes? Okay, we're gonna cross the halfway threshold, everyone. Okay, number eight. Um, so this deals with an exemption for substantial renovations to a property. Um, and so this 
and I know Councilmember Stort has a, a one on in a similar vein, um, but I just wanted to provide you by way of background. So um, mine would exempt units and buildings that have been substantially renovated within the prior 15 years and define a substantial renovation as a project that costs at least 25% of the property's total value. Um, and I wanted to note that under HUD's regulations and rules, that number is 15%. So it, I did place a higher number, which is a cost of at least 25% of the property's total value. Um, and uh, if we, we can, um, when the amendment was originally written, it was without knowledge of what would or not happen with uh, with respect to other contingencies. And since we just exempted um, 23 years um, for new construction, uh, I, I'm not sure whether the 15 years that are in my proposed amendment should be written in parity with the 23 years as well. So um, turning Ms. McCartney-Green, if you could address that. No, I, I agree. And I think the way that the amendments are proposed in terms of sequential order was that if that was going to happen then yeah. um, as a right then this should be also amended to 23 okay. years instead of 15. Thank you for that clarification. So that is my um, my amendment as uh, amended as amended as clarified uh, based on well, prior amendments. So so, so that is your you. amendment in full. Is there a second? A second. A second by Council Member Albernaz. Uh, Council Member Sales. Uh, thank you, President Glass. I just had a question about this particular amendment because I know that the original bills both had, um, I guess, um, provisions to account for capital improvement projects. So would um, these uh, percentages um, fall under those waivers already? So uh, yes. Okay. Um, the um, I'll, I'll, I can give you an example. It's better to give an example yes, to explain please. this. Um, in DC, DC is one of the jurisdictions that has a capital improvement petition, but also a substantial rehabilitation petition. Mm -hmm. And what Councilmember Lutke is proposing is effectively a substantial rehabilitation petition. And the and DC standard is fifty percent of assessed value with the intent that they were only envisioning, say, a gut rehab of a property, mm -hmm. tear everything out except for the concrete okay. and the steel or the, st or the studs. And to get at that because as some uh, uh, folks have commented to me over the past few weeks that um, there comes a point in the significant rehabilitation of a property, say a gut rehab, where the cost amortized over the time allowed in the capital improvement petition just kind of wouldn't work. Um, DC allows, if you do that 50%, that you can petition for up to 125% of the, of the rent. Um, so a, kind of a different way of going about it. Councilmember Lutke mentioned that HUD has a, a lower standard for def defining substantial rehabilitation. And so this, I'm trying to illustrate that substantial rehabilitation is a relative term. Mm -hmm. It's relative to what you're getting in exchange for it. So if you do a substantial rehabilitation and you have you know, like a 15, a 25, or a 50%, then what you get as far as a permission or a benefit is relative to what's required of you. And so just referring to HUD's definition doesn't tell you anything unless you know what the, if you meet that standard, what the triggering thing is that HUD allows you to do. Mm. And so, yes, a capital improvement petition would allow you to do most anything mm -hmm. uh, to a property. Um, though uh, Councilmember Balcom a had asked about this before, about you know carpet and, um, and paint. And carpet and paint uh, is usually a turnover thing, which is mm -hmm. dealt with through, say, a fair return, or we talked about rent banking, or yeah. the plus three. Mm -hmm. Those are ways to get at the normal, you know, like the normal turnover kind of stuff. Capital, capital improvement gets at, you know, system, uh, systems repairs, a new roof, roof. Uh, um, you know, all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff like that. And usually, substantial rehabilitation is, you know, you're kind of maxing out the intent, 
And so it depends on what percentage of the assessed value. And I know uh, uh, <laughs> Vadim has some, sorry, Craig Vadim uh, has uh, some uh, thoughts on assessed versus market value. Um, but I hope I've ex I can go into more detail if you'd like, but I probably talked too long. No, that's it. I just wanted to better understand the uh, implications of the 50 versus 25%. I know we haven't gotten there, but hopefully. Uh, Council Member Stewart. Thank you, and I thank um, Council Member Lukey for putting this forward. Um, since we both were thinking along the same lines of what to do um, with uh, buildings that were going under uh, major renovations, and I appreciate um, Director Bruton your or your comment on the different um, ways to measure um, <laughs> substantial um, rehabilitation. You know, just throwing another one out there. FEMA also has another standard by which they look at it. Um, it is closer to the 50%. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what now somebody would get for this, as, as the Director Bruton said, um, it is up to 23 years being exempt from rent stabilization. Um, so I'd like to uh, put on the table, and hopefully this will be easier than my last <laughs> amendment of an amendment, I'm hoping. I, <laughs> don't say that. I'm really hoping it's not. Um, to actually put the amount uh, in the spirit of compromise up uh, to at least 40% um, of the value of the building. And to um, one of the things that I had in my amendment that I had talked to the staff about was in order to, to clarify some of these points, having a method to um, uh, regulations promulgated, and you'll find that um, amended, the, what I'm, the section I'm talking about, the bottom of page 10 and the top of page 11. So my proposed amendment to the amendment is to change the 25 to 40 and to take uh, what's on the bottom of page 10, um, section A and, sorry, X at the top of page 11, and amend that to uh, Council Member Lukey's amendment. So Council Member Stewart's amendment is to uh, change the 25% definition to 40%. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Katz. Uh, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, just wanted to note um, one, um, the difference uh, with the capital expenditures as was discussed before, there's a 96 month Payout period, and so this, you know, this is a would be a different category that wouldn't have the eight-year, uh, you know, uh, period, and, and we took, you know, up the, the time period. So that, that that's uh, you know, a part of the, the dynamic uh, uh, as well. So I just wanted to uh, to, to note uh, to note that uh, the time period is, is part of it. I just want to clarify the twenty it, it, is the motion before us forty percent and twenty-three years to make it consistent with. The previous I'm not clear because I didn't withdraw my original was, motion well, so <laughs> she's amending 25. your amendment that was seconded yeah but I just want to make sure I understand what yeah. the underlying yeah. amendment was mm -hmm. if that was 23, 23 years. years okay so it's 23 years and then it's 50 percent is was before us the amendment is to move it to 40 percent 25 oh, sorry 25. excuse me 25 percent before us the amendment was instead of your 50 percent next you're, you're amending yeah. this to 40 yeah yeah, the details. But that was a minor thing, I think, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, that, that. Those are the clarifications I needed. I'll yield back. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Uh, I will be supporting the amended amendment <laughs> from Councilmember Stewart. And uh, just a reminder that um, when doing a significant rehab for a property requires a lot of money. Okay, I'm just going to give an example. We recently purchased, well, the county recently purchased uh, the Westchester apartment buildings in Aspen Hill. It's a transaction that worked closely with the county executive, which I'm very proud of. Uh, we spent around $70 million in that acquisition. And Enterprise, which is now, ha the company now handling this, and while wow, you're here, you can speak before on, on this. Um, they're going to be spending around, around $10 million for for five, he went down. Okay, five, and that's not a substantial rehab at all. Anybody who has millions of dollars to do a rehab, anybody who has like 50%, they opt out to actually redevelop the property, not do this. Uh, actually, being in parking planning, I barely saw any 
applications for like by, for substantial rehabs. All that to say that I don't think this is going to be widely used, but it's great to have it. Um, and without with that said, I think it's great that uh, you dropped it from 50 to 40 percent. Um, I think that's a that's a good number. 25 was too low, 50 was too high, so 40 meets my happy medium. And with that, I'm I am i ready to vote for it too. Councilmember Albanese. Um, so thank you. So um, I forget it. <laughs> I give up. Councilmember Ludke. Maybe I'll try to read your mind. Um, I I should have said this before, and I didn't. And and I have no doubt that that Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez is correct that that this maybe wasn't something that would have been widely used in the past had it existed. But I also want to remind everyone that we have big mandates coming up, um, both our own from the county and and the state's mandates that require substantial renovations that require building energy performance standards and sprinklers for high rises being a big issue that was raised you know by members of this council this this year in this year's state legislative session and i have no doubt will come up again those are really expensive projects and um what we've what we've heard and which makes sense because even you know this is why people buy have like costco memberships right you buy in bulk because you gotta you know you gotta deal with that get a discount you think you get a discount maybe you don't um but for when property owners are doing these types of renovations and they're undertaking these substantial projects they cluster them together to do things all at one time it's also less disruptive to the residents to do that so they go big um, so if you have to do new sprinklers in a building that was built without a sprinkler system or new HVAC or insulation to reduce energy use, the best way to do that and the most feasible way is to do it all the updates at once for scale. So they'll do the whole thing. They cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, and the current capital improvements language that's in there would end up, if, if amortizing over that 96 month period, it would end up, they'd have to raise the rent for like, $2,500 extra a month on a project that costs $45 million on a property valued at $123 million. Now, if it's $45 million in renovations and, and upgrades and all these environmental things that they've got to meet by date certain on a property valued at $123 million, shaving off that 10% from 50 to 40 still doesn't cover you. It still wouldn't cover you. They would still not fall into that and they would still be subject to the rent control and they might have to do the capital improvements avenue instead but then they're going to have to raise the rent on those properties by twenty five hundred dollars that's the math and then the question is do we do the renovations at all do we only do what is absolutely positively required of us are we able to stay in business this way or do we convert to condos and sell um, and so I still think that the 40% threshold is too high and it will have adverse consequences. Um, and so I'm still persisting in my request that 25% be set as the threshold. Thank you. Vice President Friedson. Uh, yes, just one more clarification. So uh, based on the change to new construction earlier, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. One of the reasons why I think it was framed the way that it was is this question of a unit that was constructed was constructed between you know within the last 23 years, but before this bill goes into effect. So I just want to make sure if we're making it consistent with the prior amendment that we mean newly constructed with within the the, the previous 23 years. <laughs> So I just want to make sure that the language says that because yeah, and going and going forward. So it would it would be on a rolling basis, yes. but it would be it would include things that were built within the last twenty three years, from the time that Correct. this bill goes into effect. Yeah. So a, a building that had been. Built. I know that was the intention. I just want to make sure because I think the reason why it was listed the way that it was is up you know uh, put in put you know rental units within the last 23 years was, was to address that transition issue. Yeah, and so for example, a, a property built in 2002 would still have two years of exemption if you, from when this law goes into effect. 
Okay, I just wanted that to be clarified uh, for the record. Go back. So there is an amendment on uh, the table to define the fair market value at 40%. All those in favor of that amendment? All those against? Uh, and that passes 8 to 3. Any other comments on the underlying amendment? Not seeing any. All those in favor of the amendment with a 40% uh, threshold for far fair market value, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Next amendment. Turn it over to Councilmember Lutke. Thank you. Um, so my next amendment, um, again, going back to DC. Uh, mirrors the language that is used in DC's law, which exempts um, natural person landlords, and I'll explain that in a moment, um, who own four or fewer units or properties for rent in the county. Um, and so a natural person meaning you, me, not an LLC, right? And, and you know we could probably talk for hours separately about the nefarious things that go on and, and, and the little shell games with the LLC. So that's very clear, does not apply. Um, but it does include the trust or estate of a decedent. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to make that clear is because sometimes multiple family members who are not married may own a property, a house, um, and it is one of them passes away and then only one-third interest if you will if it's three owners is is it held in in trust uh, or as part of the decedent's estate and um, the goal being to keep as many of these what I would call mom and pop landlords who own a couple properties and they they rent them out um, to keep people housed in those units rather than having those go on the market for sale um, because that will reduce that would reduce the um, the number of rental units that we have um, so they don't have the the unit the number of units or scale to continue renovating those properties under strict rent control regime the way that you know multi-unit apartment buildings may um, it's financed differently they're they're just individuals who own who own the property um, and I want to make sure that you know these are folks for whom this isn't their business. It's not their primary business, but they do have um, a vital part of our rental economy they own, and um, we want to make sure that they stay on the market. So, uh, just want this to match what Washington D.C. already has in place for small landlords, um, while making sure landlords don't create LLCs to circumvent this exception. And I yield. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councilmember Balcom. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I like to do a friendly amendment, please. I, I've been all along thought that that one should be exempt. That that uh, if somebody uh, had had lived in a home and was in the military and and moved and wanted mm -hmm. to rent their home out until they came back, um, I've heard from various people and. And I see, and I realize where the, the number four came up, but I, in is in the art of, uh, and nobody should use the art of compromise anymore. But in compromise, I I uh, believe we should go to two units. So as a friendly amendment, I'd like to suggest the two two units rather than four. There's an amendment. I'll, uh, uh, I'll accept, accept that. that? Yep. Okay, accept that as friendly amendment. Councilmember Albernas. Sorry, um, we, we, we want to encourage uh, people to invest and uh, create more housing options and opportunities in the county. And you know, it takes a lot for somebody to take the leap and rent out their or other properties. Um, it's complex, it's expensive, you have to hire lawyers, you have to get insurance. Um, there's a lot involved and we're by our actions taken today going to add pretty significantly another layer of complexities. And I go back to something I said earlier with Vision 2050 um, and we're hoping um, and, and setting the table for there to, uh, to increase housing uh, you know, and, and, and density in as many places as we can. 
And so I supported, uh, I would support at four units, but I'm also I'm crashing and burning on a lot of different issues here. So I think it's important for us to, you know, if, if two is what's going to get us to six votes, then I'll support two. Um, but I think anything and everything that we can do at this point uh, to encourage people uh, to move forward and add more housing options is the right thing to do. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. We we discussed this uh, at length in, in the uh, Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. <laughs> Director Bruton is smiling. Um, there are some unfortunate gaps in data. One of the things we need to find out with either way this amendment goes, and I, and I won't bear the lead, I won't support it for the reasons I didn't support it in committee. Um, having been one of these people who has a primary residence who rents who rented another home um you know some years you didn't raise rent because you liked your renter some years you didn't we don't have a sense of that universe we don't know today how many people are in this category uh, but the people who we do know for example that many of the folks who rent single family homes is is a, a little under a quarter of the total stock of rental housing um, and I think we want to provide consistent stability for everybody um, and you have to register to become to have whether you have one unit or a hundred units or one one property or a hundred properties you still have to register with DHCA to have a rental license isn't that correct director Bruton? Yes, yes. so at that time you will be apprised of your rights uh, or, or your responsibilities um, and so I don't think we want to say that if you just have one unit, you know, do whatever you want. A lot of people, especially not knowing the universe of people in that uh, category. So uh, I appreciate Council Member Katz, you know, reducing it. Um, I just, I don't think it's uh, advisable to do it considering we don't know how many people th this impacts um, and we're trying to provide stability for renters. We should do it across the board. So for those reasons, I won't support it. Thank you. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. As it was noted, this was a, a big issue at the PHP committee, and I have said it before. I will only make the exception of one, just because if you own one or more, one more home, like more than one, that's a business, period. Um, and but I understand the value of compromising, my friend, and I was really hard on this one at PHP, and again, I'm gonna have to compromise to move us forward. I don't like it, um, but the good thing that is come up, that is, will come out of this whole legislation is that your department is gonna have more resources, and, and hopefully, through those resources, I'm committed and I'm telling you right now, especially ahead of the budget, the next budget, I am committed to make sure that you have everything you need to make sure that this is, um, that we're going to be able to, to, compliance should be key to make sure that people are following this. But that's just me. I'm com making my own commitment here. Um, the good thing is that it's going to come out is that we're going to see the data. How many single family homes are out there? Um, that should be registered and how much money are they charging and all that good stuff. So I'm going to see the positive and just move on and, and I'll support your friendly amendment, uh, Council Member Katz. That's it. Thank you. So there is amendment, uh, an amended amendment, a friendly amendment before us. Uh, the full amendment is to uh, exempt uh, property owners that own two or fewer rental units. Um, all those in favor of Councilmember Ludke's amendment? All those opposed? And that passes nine to two. Next, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, this, I don't know, this may be quick. <laughs> um, so this is an exemption for month-to-month uh, -month tenancies, um, and this was, uh, it, I, I think it's a um, relatively small group of people. However, um, the amendment is that if, um, if a tenant is offered um, a lease but declines, the, uh, then 
this would be um, uh, exempt. And the rationale here is that um, the, the, if the landlord doesn't get the protection of a lease, um, then the tenant should not get the protection of the rent stabilization increase. Um, there would still be the limitation that rent could only be increased once a year. I, I want to confirm that. And that adequate notice would still have to be given for the increase. So I wanted to confirm that. I uh, just wanted to say that um, if uh, a continuing tenant uh, goes beyond their lease, then their lease is still in effect. So the landlord would still have full protection of that uh, regardless. But not, a, but not, but they wouldn't have the protection of they that it could end any time. They wouldn't have a two-year lease or a one-year lease. Yes, the, the 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 tenant would be able to give whatever notice. I'll, yeah. I'll let my betters but, answer that. I want to back up here, and yeah. so just county law, existing county law, landlords should offer a two-year lease. Tenant has the option to decline the two-year lease and revert to a one-year. There's a one-year lease that's in effect. Um, at the end of that 12 month, if the tenant does not renew their lease, they become a month-to-month -month tenant. And in, in that provision, at least by the, the the example lease that we provide to landlords or some of the advice that we provide is that the rent that was initially provided to the tenant during that 12 month continues tenant does become a holdover tenant and then we, we jump out of a little bit of, of county law now into state law and as a holdover tenant the landlord does have some remedy in terms of having that tenant um, removed legally from the property but the rent itself would still remain as what it was when they initially signed that lease I'm checking with Ms. Kachman is just to that's correct once a tenant is on a month-to-month -month lease either party either the landlord or a tenant can provide a notice um, to vacate essentially or to end the lease. So my point is that the, the landlord should be able to raise the rent in addition to this uh, the, the three plus uh, CPI because the, if, if the tenant doesn't sign the lease or doesn't doesn't renew the lease, then the the landlord doesn't have the same protection that if if they renewed the lease. So, yeah. So first, uh, yeah. is uh, you have a motion on the table? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Albanos. So when when I talked, I'm sorry, Miss Wellens, <laughs> I thought that this, that 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 was clear. So perhaps it's not. Uh, I mean, if the amendment is that that they should have an increase in, in rent, yes. that's, that's definitely yes. something plausible that the council can consider. But in terms of what's available, the tenant becomes a holdover tenant. Mm -hmm. By the lease terms that were originally agreed to, that's usually what's in effect. Um, the landlord has the right to enforce that or use that in court. Here, the council may consider whether or not, you know, the rent stabilization, you know, doesn't apply. And that's that's something you can consider here obviously but the landlord does have a remedy just just so that clear and the tenant is no longer protected as a as staying in there in the property for um, other than a holdover tenant but the t so the point would be in my, in my intent of this was that um, if the landlord was not didn't want to take legal remedy to vacate the the, the tenancy that an option would be to increase the rent higher than uh, what's currently the cap. And my understanding was that that would be allowable through uh, this amendment. That's correct. And that's something for the council to consider today. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just ask a, a, a quick question before I turn it over to colleagues. Uh, so, uh, Ms. McCartney Green, you, you talked about the the, the, com the compliance with regard to a lease, uh, uh, with regard to a lease. Uh, uh, upon a new lease, a tenant, a landlord has to offer a two-year lease, which the 
tenant can reject in favor of just a one-year lease. At the end of that lease, and you were just referring to state law and holdover, at the end of that lease, does is the landlord compelled or required to offer another annual lease? No, they're not uh, right. compelled to do that. That's really important. And so I absolutely understand uh, and I'm sympathetic to Councilmember Balcom's larger point. And the larger point is this, and it's, it, it shouldn't be lost on people, that this is about uh, an agreement, it's about a compact, and it's about making it fair. And the tenant, in exchange for living in that unit, paying rent, being a really good person, um, they get the benefit of rent stabilization so that they can stay there long. The minute they don't sign a lease, a long-term lease, their intention is not to stay there that long. And I believe that's, that's the disconnect. And so if the tenant is signaling that they don't want to be there for a long time, then what is what compels or what should compel the landlord to enter into this agreement of rent stabilization of CPI plus three? I understand that. My problem, and I think the problem, is that because a landlord is not compelled to offer another annual lease, the month to month becomes the de facto way of increasing rent, or because, let's say it again, we need just cause eviction, that this is just another loophole. So I, I legally understand, um, but I think it's problematic and I won't be supporting it. Council Member Fani Gonzalez. I think um, people need to understand that when you have a lease that is up, the landlord will come to you and will tell you, let me offer you a new contract, you whether agree or not. If you do not agree and you decide that you want to stay, the landlord has the right of going to court, of going to the land, the landlord and tenant's uh, board um, to look for remedy but the landlord has the capacity of removing the tenant if the tenant refuses to sign a new lease. There's no need. Besides, let me tell you why I oppose this amendment. I, and I'm gonna go back to the example of the um, Westchester apartments in Aspen Hill. When I joined the county council, the first phone calls that I received was from that community. And you know what they told me? Once you have an apartment building and it's for sale, because that building was for sale, when you're selling a property to another entity, you know what happens? All the agreements, all the tenant agreements that you have, they basically disappear. So they are on a month to month because now the new owner of the building, he or she wants to have their own agreements with the tenants. So the fear that this community have was that they were gonna go month to month without knowing what increases they were gonna have, if the rents were gonna go up to 20%, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, again, I think we're overcomplicating this, and this is this amendment is not new. It was brought up to my attention um, when we drafted the bill before the PHP, and I kept telling that person who wanted it, no, I won't do it. They went to a council member. The council member came to me, asked me to sign on it, and I said I will not do it. And now you have it, but I will not support this. That's the beauty of having 11 voices. No we can all do what we think is important to do. Yes. In, so if one council member doesn't, another yes. council member can. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if there, it doesn't seem like there's um, any agreement, but I, I'm, I want the amendment to, st uh, the propo the, um, the you proposal, You want to keep it on the table. Please. Yep, that's yes. okay. You, you have that prerogative. Council Member Stewart. You. Um, thank you. I'll be quick. I'll just say that um, I think Council President Glass um, really did say it incredibly well, the reason why that uh, I'm not supporting this moving forward. And the only other thing I will add is from um, my own personal experience is also um, when I was mayor, the people who do go month to month tend to be our most vulnerable residents. Um, we heard that from, you know, the letter we received that many times educators will go month to month because they don't know where they're going to be assigned. Um, I have personally witnessed people who are experiencing illness in their family, military families, or people who are in other 
types of jobs where they could be deployed um, sometimes will go month to month. And so um, I, I very much appreciate, mm -hmm. again, er, all the work we are all doing, but I just wanted to bring that um, to the conversation. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. I appreciate uh, the conversation. I appreciate Councilmember Balcom putting it forward. Uh, in addition to them being the most vulnerable, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of tenants are in actually in month to month because if you're not offered a lease renewal, again, 40% of our county rents, if you're not offered a lease renewal, you automatically roll over into month to month. Um, and uh, so either because the landlord didn't have time or, you know, there's a thousand reasons why it could happen. Um, and also, a lot of the complaints we received from tenants would send us the the letter and it would have three numbers on it. It would have, if you want to do month to month, and I know we've seen these in, in landlord tenant, it is the highest, most extreme price that you would ever, it's, there's no way you would select it. It's like, you know, this is, chart, do $5,000 a month for month to month. And then it'll say two years, something, you know, that may be a 15 or 10% increase and then one year, 20%, you know. So it, it, it's actually some, the, the bigger landlords offer it on the sheet, but it's often the highest one they offer. So to exempt that, I think, would just be very counterproductive for that reason, too. So um, just wanted to mention those points. Thank you. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to clarify, the amendment as proposed specifically requires that a tenant be offered and decline a lease renewal. And so it is true that there are a huge number of month-to-month -month tenants in the county, and they are, I'm, I imagine, although we don't have specific data to this, but anecdotally at least, I think we can all recognize they are some of the most vulnerable uh, tenants and residents uh, that we have. So I appreciate that point uh, from Councilmember uh, Stewart. Uh, but the way it was proposed, I just wanted to be fair to the amendment as it was proposed. The amendment was proposed to say you're offered an annual lease and the annual lease is rejected. And, uh, you know, so everyone is free to do what they want. I do think that if this amendment were in place, we'd have fewer month-to-month -month holdovers and more uh, longer-term leases. That is a policy objective of the county to incentivize and to uh, try to uh, create as many longer-term lease terms as possible. That's why we require a two-year to be offered uh, in the uh, uh, initial uh, tenancy, that's a requirement under county law, uh, but I just wanted to be fair to the, the mover of the motion. It was characterized in a way that is not consistent with what was moved forward, and so I think, you know, everyone should be aware of that. I'll yield back. Councilmember Albernaz. Thanks. I was going to make the same point, and I appreciate the other points folks have made. Scott, any insight here? I think there's you, there's general agreement in what Councilmember Balcom is uh, trying to do, mm -hmm. um, but understandable concerns have been raised. Is there another way of that you would suggest addressing this? Um, I would actually defer to uh, the two other folks here who know uh, the the tenancy law and have more tenancy uh, uh, more experience, especially uh, Nicole on the tenancy side, than me to answer. There's no alternative that I can recommend at this point. Okay. Council Member Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, so I, I did want to just reiterate that this is if uh, a tenant was offered a lease and declined. Um, and I really um, appreciate what Council Member Mink said about, um, excuse me, Council Member Stewart said about um, the vulnerable populations. I think that one of the overall issues of uh, rent stabilization and and this bill that we I don't think we've addressed today is that it doesn't just target vulnerable populations it targets everyone and so um, I we don't know the numbers we have anecdotal data about um, who chooses to go month to month um, but my my expectation is is that there are many people who go to month month to month for many different reasons and they may or may not uh, and, and they may do that because it's convenient for them um, they don't want to get into a long-term commitment for many reasons and when that happens the landlord doesn't have any protections um, so I just wanted to make that statement thank you 
Okay, there is an amendment on the table uh, made by Councilmember Balcom. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? And the amendment fails 7 to 4. Amendment number 11, or I, uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez to. And withdraw in that one because we, we passed yours. So. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Council member, I'll turn it over for amendment number 12, Council member Balcom. Okay, so this has to be the easiest one. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Second, second. <laughs> so, um, so um, I would like to propose an amendment that we change the title of the bill uh, from anti-rent uh, gouging protections and I always, I always thought the hyphen was in the wrong place anyway for the anti-rent gouging protections, uh, but to change it to rent stabilization, um, I think for many reasons. When you know, when the bill was initially um, proposed and had the um, co-sponsors, it really was focused on anti-gouging, and um, the current bill uh, in front of us to, uh, right now is quite different from that. So I, I propose that change. Is there a second? Uh, seconded by Council Member Juwando. Uh, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Uh, I'm going to say two things. One, I never liked the word anti gouging just because I'm a very positive person. So I, I actually like rent stabilization. So that's one point, and I will support this. But number two, who are we talking about here? For people who are low income and who are getting $100, $200 rent increases, it's anti gouging. It is. Period. No matter how you want to flip phrase it or, or, or paint it or rephrase it, we're talking about the most vulnerable communities who are struggling and having like one, two, three percent or 15, 20 percent is anti-gouging for them. So let's just move on and I'll say yes because I do like your name much better. So. Council Member Jawanda. Uh, I also will support it. Um, you know, the only thing I could think of would be better would be the Home Act. Uh. But. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but no, I, I appreciate Council Member Balcom. I think this is an apt name. Uh, ha ha having been someone who had introduced an anti rent gouging bill last set, you know, I think there's determination about what's what, but I appreciate it and happy to support it. Thank you. Okay. All those in support of the amendment, raise your hand. All those against, all those abstain. Okay. So that's 10 to 1 abstention. Okay, uh, on to item number 13, uh, Council Member Mink. Uh, this is just moving up the effective date to, um, it'll set it to the standard 91 days, which aligns nicely with the warning period that um, landlords give to tenants. And um, uh, obviously we still have the other provision in place and we're gonna work to move the regs through. So uh, the intent was to be uncontroversial, um, but Ms. Bruton, if you have any uh, concerns, please flag. Uh, no. Um, then I will make a motion to move that amendment. Uh, is there a second? Yeah. Seconded by Councilmember Jawando. Any comments? Anybody? Or no? Oh, uh, Vice President Friedson. I knew people want to talk. Yeah, so I just want to clarify this vis-a-vis -vis the other amendment that we took up last year, I mean, earlier this morning. Um, <laughs> so let's talk in plain language of what this means, because I think it's important when we vote on it. And there was a lot of confusion. And I tried my best to clarify, even on things I disagree on. I think we all should know what we're voting on, and we can vote different ways and respect each other while we do it. But plain language, what we voted on earlier, which does not allow any aspect of the bill to take effect until the regs have been approved, because they're method two regulations that have to come to the council that can be amended by the council based on how they're proposed uh, by the executive branch. Nothing in the bill goes into effect until the regulations are approved. The way I read this, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it, and you can clarify in plain language. This sets it to, ni to, to uh, 90 days, and then there's uh, three months after the bill takes effect, the regulations. 
So could you just confirm and clarify how this interfaces? Yes, I, I can start from the beginning just to provide a timeline. Um, and so <clears throat> if the law becomes, becomes law, meaning that the council adopts the bill today and the uh, county executive signs the bill within the required 10 days, uh, what happens next is that from there, as currently written, and then I'll talk about the council member makes amendment, as currently written would take effect six months from the signing of um, the bill by the CE. That's going to put you roughly late January of 2024, just in terms of practicality. From January 2024, within three months, the regulations are due to the county register. That's where Mr. Burton comes in, and um, that would take us to April, late April 2024. After the regs have been sent to the county registry, there's a 30-day period, comment period, that happens. That takes us now to late May 2024. Um, the council has at least 60 days to review and approve the regulations. If we extend that 60 days, the latest that this regulations would be approved would be late July 2024. Councilmember Mink has made an amendment to kind of expedite that time. So instead of us being instead of the council reviewing the regulations late 2024 July 2024 it would move it up three months so basically by late April 2024 is when the whole process would be completed meaning the signing the regulations sent to the county register the common period and then the approval by the council I did that slowly but I'm not sure if I need clarification thank you for the clarification so as I was listening to your timeline, without this amendment, this piece of legislation, if approved and signed, would effectively, all the components of it, go into effect next July, one year from now. Right, that's the latest time. So right. it obviously, yes, it could It, it could be so. moved yes. quicker so right. long as DHCA and the other uh, mechanisms move quickly, including right. method two on our end as well. And if this amendment is not, uh, uh, and if this amendment is adopted, it would be around April of next year. That's correct. Okay. Not seeing any comments. Uh, Council Member Fonda Gonzalez, I told you there uh, were people waiting to talk. Uh -huh. uh, the question is for Mr. Bruton. Can you handle the time frame? Um, I think we can. That's why I mentioned earlier that I had talked with the Office of the County Attorney and uh, 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 Cliff Royalty had said that they would provide a significant amount of support and so I think it's both in tenants interest to have this in effect as soon as possible but also landlords interest to have clarity as soon as possible about what's going on. Very helpful. Thank you so much. I'll be voting in favor. Councilmember Alvin uh, You think, I mean I, I, I get that um, and so we're going to give it what happens if we don't meet that deadline? Is there an opportunity to extend if, if for some legitimate reason there are legal concerns, challenges, or are we setting ourselves up for failure here by having an arbitrary date, or is there another recourse for us in the event that we have to extend, we can extend? The council by resolution can extend the opportunity to review the method two regulations, and so that's just by resolution. That wouldn't change any of the parameters of the bill. Okay, that's helpful. Councilmember Balcom. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I may have. <clears throat> I, I said yes, we could um, have an extension on the deadline uh, by resolution, so the council would have to approve a resolution to extend the timeline um, to receive or to approve the Method 2 regulations. Yes. So, so thank you. Um, so my, my question was going to be the same in terms of, of capacity and um, the regulations are coming back to us, and, and given the lengthy conversation we had today, um, the regulations is really is where we get into the detail. And so um, I think that um, not only is it going to take some time to write, but it's also going to take time to review and, and approve. Um, so I, I am a little bit concerned about the time, but if there's the remedy of the, the regardless of this amendment, 
the bill won't go into effect until after the regs have been approved. That's correct, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Councilman Brown, just to make sure, that's what the transition language that we, are, the first amendment that we approved this morning, right. has that stopgap between approval. Uh, Vice President Friedson. Yeah, just to clarify, there's two, I just want to make sure I understand, there's two triggers here, or three really. When the bill goes into effect, when the bill requires the regulations to be submitted to the county register, which is essentially for public comment, and then the time at which the council under method two regulations is required to take up the uh, the bill. Any of those re requirements, particularly the, you know, the, uh, you know, particularly the time at which we take the 60 days, we can always extend the 60 days. I will just note to think about the timing of when the council is going to be expected to take up what could be the most controversial regulations that this body has ever taken up in its history in the middle of the budget. So I just want people to think about that and uh, just set realistic expectations that the idea of you know, requiring additional time just based on where things fall on the calendar and being realistic of you know what can be uh, handled and absorbed by DHCA that also will be here a lot talking about their budget. Um, you know, I just uh, wanted to, to note that. I'll yield back. Uh, I'll also add for consideration that later, uh, by the end of this year, we should be getting the regulations for the building energy performance standards, which we'll be taking up next year as well. Council Member Ludke. Um, I just have a quick question, which is, like is is the point of this and I know it mirrors the 90 days notice for you know that landlords have to give and so is the is this really more a symbolic thing to make that statement or because the net effect of it given the fact that nothing can happen until after the regulations are done doesn't really it doesn't expedite anything in any way I mean it short it it shortens the fastest possible timeline by by that much, and what is actually realistic, and do, you know what you know, we'll see. Um, but it opens the window of opportunity if we're able to get something done to provide some uh, uh, clarity to all of the various stakeholders. Then that would be a net good. Okay, but even with the notice and comment period that the regulations must undergo, could that happen in ninety days? Ninety one days. Just for clarity, our bills on a whole take effect within 91 days unless it's specified differently in the legislation. So here, whether we, uh, you know, council adopts the amendment or or, or not, um, but what it does is what the existing language is is the six months. And so, if we want to condense it by amending that language or removing the effect, like it would, either way, we would get to the the um, amendment on the floor. Um, it's just whether or not we are looking at a late April. Or a late July, um, I think that's the difference between. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you, thank you. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I appreciate it. the amendment. Just removes the six. This, yeah, so it just says current law. Okay. It just becomes a and direct. So this bill would become law three months after ninety one day ninety one days after we pass it, right? And then uh, after the executive signs it, excuse me. I think I think he's going to sign it, um, and then the director Bruton, who has been working really hard with his team on the regulations, this doesn't preclude them sending the regulations sooner than than pre-budget time, for example. So I, I, while that's the kind of the the end time, April ish, if we were to pass this amendment, which I will support, we could take it up sooner. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of Councilmember Mink's effective date amendment, raise your hand. All those, uh, all the. There you go. That is unanimous. Three months difference. Okay. Last scheduled amendment. Uh, before us, I'll turn to Council Member Albernaz. Thank you. Uh, so we've been at this for almost five hours, um, and obviously there were several committee sessions in PUP before that, and uh, Council Member Friedson held an event uh, in which we received information from the public before either bill was formally introduced. And so we've been um, we've been at this a long time. 
And I think all of us understand the weights of the decision and the vote we are about to take on from all angles. Um, as was noted in my opening comments, um, both Prince George's and the District of Columbia have built sunsets into the legislation that they have passed in order to give their jurisdictions the opportunity uh, to assess and evaluate where they are, but also to address the immediate need before us. Uh, the, the main data point that's been used to, to justify uh, moving forward with this legislation at all um, is, I believe, the 200% increase in the amount of complaints that have been registered through DHCA um, for exorbitant rent increases. Um, and I believe, Scott, when you testified before us, somewhere between 100 and 150 um, that have formally been reported. And so I think that um, I was originally intending to propose a three-year sunset, which gives this body or the next body um, the opportunity to check in and evaluate how things are going. Um, has the market slowed down? Have we not been able to see the growth that we need? Are we falling further behind on the uh, ambitious goals we've set forward for housing moving forward and through through the Council of Governments. Um, I, I think it should actually be five years, not three years, um, because that would give the 21st Council a full year and a half uh, when you talk about when this will be enacted to evaluate and assess, and they will be able to decide not to pursue the sunset, but it requires a check-in moment. Now, we will be receiving data that has been noted um, you know, then, and, and, but um, I think the practical and political reality um, is that it will give the next council an opportunity to weigh this from all sides and will have ample information from which to make a decision. Uh, I remain deeply concerned about the potential negative impacts for this and just based on our conversation over the last several hours, a lot of what has been rected, uh, uh, recommended is based on assumptions and, and you know, not, not a lot of data, <laughs> not a lot of information. Um, but we're going to move forward anyways because all of us are uh, concerned with ensuring that we protect especially our most vulnerable residents. So I am proposing a five-year sunset from the date of enactment of the signing of the bill. Um, to provide the next council an opportunity, as the District of Columbia has and as Prince George's County has, uh, to evaluate and see where things stand and decide what course of action to take at that point. And Councilmember Albert and I, just to uh, be clear, the packet says three years, but you're saying five. Correct. Okay, very good. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Balcom. Uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. I'm glad this is the last one. I I have compromised a whole lot from the very beginning before even PHP. This is a point that has been brought to my attention many times before PHP, and this is something I will not compromise. I will not vote for a sunset. I think it's actually bad policy. And number one, we're gonna be evaluating every year, not just with our housing uh, department, but also with the planning department that keeps track on, on many things uh, relating to housing in this county. Um, and two, the whole point of the, the political reality is that, well, actually, before I talk the political reality, I'm going to mention to you that at any time, at any point, anyone can bring up this bill again in amend or create a brand new bill that will replace this at any point. No one, there's like no law that says that you cannot do such thing. So it's not needed. And the last thing I'm gonna say about the political reality, I'm glad you switched from three to five because three years is election time. And I'm planning to run for election, by the way. <laughs> this will be, you make this three or even five years, this becomes uh, a campaign issue, an electoral issue, and let me, assure you, and I don't think anybody, call me arrogant, because I could be arrogant, mm -hmm. call me arrogant, but I don't think anybody in this place knocked 
on as many doors that as I did in my election. I knocked on over 8,000 doors by myself, and I am telling you, transportation and housing were the number one issues. People telling me, you know, even people who have their own homes telling me, I have children, you know, that you graduated from college, and now, now they're living in my basement. They cannot afford a place to live here. It's, it's a campaign issue. You will lose, if, I'm telling you, if you don't understand that people are struggling and we need to protect people, tenants, people living in this county. It's not just about making sure that people work here, but it's also about making sure people get to live here. And home ownership, we haven't talked about that. That's something that I'm very passionate about. That's like second part. And I'm hoping each one of you who are here talking about tenant rights, you can be also as powerful and as 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 uh, vocal, there you go, I was gonna say that word, vocal, to say, um, to push for more jobs, sustainable jobs, green jobs, making sure that the school system, I see the teachers around here, uh, I'm going after you too, uh, making sure our kids have the support they need, you know, to do great in school. Um, so, you know, this this is just bad policy, I'm gonna vote no, and I'm really hoping my colleagues, um, you know, stand strong and say no to this amendment. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. I uh, appreciate my good friend, Councilmember Albernaz, putting this forth in good faith. He, he mentioned it to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, I understand why you did so. Uh, as I sit next to my other good friend here, Councilmember Katz, um, this has been a, a arduous and difficult process. Um, I don't think we want to set up an automatic, arduous, and difficult process that soon. Right? I, I think any council, we will opt, we will have to tweak this, the regs, and maybe even the bill down the line. I mean, there's no, you know, policy is iterative by its very nature. Um, there's a reason in Congress they, they do the ag bill every, every couple years, and everything's a reauthorization because you learn things. But I, I think it is an important point that we say today, here in a few moments hopefully, that we are going to pass permanent rent stabilization in Montgomery County. I think that, uh, and this would put that in question. So I think uh, this is important. I also think it's important we don't want to create perverse incentives. We've talked about that earlier. There could be folks, and again, when you have 400,000 people renting, there could be some people who say, well, we're going to purposely not build. Uh, for the next couple of years so that we can prove that this didn't work. Um, we don't want to send that signal. So um, I understand. I am equally um, interested in the data uh, and to looking at it in real ways and to making sure you have the resources, you and your colleagues, Director Bruton, have the resources to collect the data and to enforce this law. Uh, again, I, as a civil rights lawyer, I'll say this until the day I die, a protection is only as good as your ability to actually understand that you have it and to have it be enforced. Uh, and so we must, we must make sure in implementation that you have those resources. So uh, for all those reasons, I, I will not support this amendment, but I certainly do understand uh, Councilmember Robinson's reason for putting it forward. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Uh, it's always tough to follow the uh, uh, Fanny Gonzalez, Juwando, uh one-two <laughs> punch, uh, but I will. Um, so, um, I fully understand that any legislation can be taken up at any time uh, for any reason by the body. Uh, I do support a sunset because it, it, it forces the body to look at the, the legislation and to make sure that it's doing what it intended to do uh, because this is such a complex and um, a passionate issue, it, it would be very easy to put it off and put it off and put it off. I think a sunset really focuses the um, attention on does this, is this bill doing what it's supposed to do? Um, and uh, while I may not have knocked on quite as many doors as my colleague, uh, I knocked on a whole lot of doors and no one up here, sitting up here, doesn't understand the importance and complexity of housing. We all do. Um, and so I think that um, I, I support this. I think one of the issues that we have to resolve uh, quickly is the actual number of housing starts in that we've had in 
in Montgomery County. There's been some debate about what those housing starts are uh, because that's going to be very critical to evaluating um, this bill. So I, I, I second it. I do support it. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, and um, you know, much to what Councilmember Balcom just said, and I'm new to this body. We six of us are new to this body, um, but there's a tendency, and I'm coming at this from having not been a legislator, but been on the operationalizing side of things. There's a huge tendency in people to say, "I did a really great thing, and I'm going to keep an eye on it until the next shiny ball passes by, and then your eyesight is totally gone." from the thing you said you were going to follow up on. And that's the nature of the beast, right? But by putting a sunset provision in, and this is also something that's done in state law, it really does force us to closely examine, and we should be looking at it on an annual basis, and we should be tracking it, not just waiting till five years from now, but knowing that we will have to take concrete action in five years to say what's working, what isn't working, what needs tweaking, what needs amending, and how it needs to get done, and we have to all be accountable to that, period. Um, and so that is the reason, and knowing that there are huge implications for this entire bill to our entire rental housing market, and wanting to make sure that we didn't tip the scale too far in one direction and really shoot ourselves in the foot over those 31,000 rental units that need to come online before 2030 um, because we are nowhere near that number at all. Um, so I strongly support this and I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you. Council Member Mink. Thank you. Appreciate the conversation. Um, I wanted to uh, see, Director Bruton, if you have any uh, thoughts or insights on what some of the market consequences are or impacts of a sunset date on on a rent stabilization bill. Okay. Um, I'll offer a little clarification and then a response to your question. Uh, referencing what Councilmember Albernaz said earlier uh, regarding the sunsets for two member uh, two neighboring jurisdictions, uh, it's my understanding that Prince George's County has uh, a one year. Uh, provision, but uh, from my understanding, the council's intent is to follow it up with a permanent law, and it was a placeholder to put to put the provisions in effect while they worked on more, uh, you know, like a more fulsome and complex law. And then uh, the District of Columbia, for multiple decades, has had an every ten year. Um, they've done an every ten year extension. Um, so with that context. Um, as other folks have mentioned before, the shorter uh, uh, a sunset, the more uncertainty it adds. Uh, folks will, you know, be uncertain of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, folks may, uh, it could actually make people uh, not engage in, in new projects while they wait to see what's going to happen as compared to having the certainty of, I may not like the law as a, you know, a developer may not like the law, but they have certainty going forward. And if there is a sunset, um, then that increases uncertainty about the long-term future of a project. And so say for example, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, so I won't, I won't be able to support this amendment, but I certainly um, appreciate and respect the spirit of it in that I think it's really, really essential that we continue to um, look back at this regularly. Um, and uh, you know, we will be accumulating great data like we used to do a few decades ago, and that's going to allow us to hopefully be more nimble and we can be more responsive to, uh, you know, to, to what's going on uh, economically, to state legislation, all of those things. Um, I think just as a general rule, rent regulations, and this was reflected in the OLO report, also are a, you know, a piece of legislation that is not a, a set it and forget it type of thing. Um, we, ha we have seen that uh, you know, there are other jurisdictions where because um, inflation is so high and expenses are so tight, there are places that are lowering their caps right now and then they will, they will raise them again at, at other times. So you know, making those little flexes in response to, uh, uh, to, to the market, but, but overall still um, providing a, um, 
a, a relatively stable experience. And so I would be very hesitant to put a sunset date on it, especially um, given that feedback. We, we don't want to add another barrier to um, uh, you know, developers and the negotiations that they might be doing with lenders and that kind of thing. If we can provide, I think, something concrete that is helpful. Um, but certainly, I think making sure that we are coming back to check in on this every year to uh, Councilmember Ludicky's point is is essential. Councilmember Sales. Yes, I too want to thank my colleague, um, Councilmember Albernos, for introducing uh, the sunset provision. Um, as I stated at the beginning of this discussion, you know, um, we have to prioritize parameters and guardrails to establish a framework for keeping our renters housed and um, periodically reviewing the rental housing market to assess conditions to review and adjust policies um, allows for greater flexibility to meet the needs of our renters and our landlords. Um, so in addition to an annual review of um, whichever benchmarks we identify, um, are there any other provisions beside a sunset that we can use or just the normal uh, amend and review if necessary based on the data that we receive? Um, uh, legally, uh, it's the amend and review, uh, but my assumption is that the PHP committee uh, will be asking us for at least annual, uh, if not quarterly, especially, well, once we get up and running, uh, uh, reports. Um, and in consultation with the rest of the council, we'll determine uh, uh, metrics uh, that they want us to, to track and analyze in cooperation uh, with the, the planning department. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Councilmember Albernos. Thanks uh, for the comments, colleagues. This whole bill is a disruption to the marketplace. Um, so we'll, we'll, we, it's just a question of how much. That's the only question at this point. So, um, and I appreciate the commitment from colleagues, particularly Councilmember Funny Gonzalez, who is you know, on, now on record saying that she is willing to amend and change the law and change course if we need to, um, because that, that will you know, be obviously really important moving forward. So um, the same passionate advocates who are advocating for the legislation today will continue to advocate as, as you would expect. Um, and so it's important for this body um, with more information uh, to assess and change and maybe dramatically if we need to. So um, thank you. Uh, that's it for now. This is probably not going to succeed, but um, I think the background on it is, you know, I, I shared why I moved it forward to begin with. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, uh, Councilmember Albanaz and I and others have certainly had this conversation from the very beginning. I, I always thought that there should be a sunset. I thought that it would literally hold our feet to the fire. I didn't realize that the conversation would be that we were going to have a sunset during during our meeting but but um, um, I, I thought that it was necessary that we continue to to update uh, on on this legislation I also have to say that it, it's it's not lost on me that I'm the only council member who's sitting up here that is term limited I, you know five years from now I'm, I'm not I'm not going to be here um, on this body. This, you'll be with yeah, I'll be with you. Yeah, yeah. No, I ain't. I ain't. Don't start that, Jawando. But anyhow, um, but y you know my point. And so I do believe that this is something that my colleagues are going to have to continue to get updates on. And and really, the five five years, th these conversations are going to happen before five years. I mean, this is. This is something that as much as every one of us would like to think that we can predict everything in the future, we cannot. And there's going to be tweaks and there's going to be changes. So as much as I would agree with the, the idea of a sunset, I, I uh, also understand why we should not have one. And, and it has been pointed out to me by my colleagues 
that in a legislative body you can bring something back up any old time. So anyhow, I, I appreciate this. And, and can, candidly, I was the one who asked Councilmember Albernaz rather than be three to go to five. I thought that that was the, the logical number. And I also understand that somebody can you know, say, you know what, we're going to wait. We're not going to do this. We're going to prove to the world that, that, we, uh, that, that the legislation was not good legislation and therefore going to wait it out. And I don't think that's a, a good thing for any of us either. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. There is a motion on the table to sunset this legislation after five years. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? And the motion fails. So that is... Council uh, President. All yes. I'm sorry. No. Uh oh. <laughs> I just want to I just want to clarify that the PHP committee did give the council staff authority to make any technical corrections or changes, considering the numerous amendments that we considered today. I'm just asking for permission from the council uh, to make any technical corrections or clarifications, subject to obviously the council's final approval. Without objection. And then lastly, I would be re remiss if I didn't mention uh, re thanks to Ms. Christine Wellens, who was very much uh, the author of the packet. And thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice President Friedson. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, three quick clarifications, I hope quick. Uh, number one, um, on vacant units, given what we have done now with vacancy control. I just want to make sure the amendment that was before us didn't really address the question of the, there's base rent. And so the question is, base rent is defined in, in the bill as it was originally introduced. We have not changed the definition of base rent. The question is if a unit has been vacant for a period of time, what is the base rent? That is not, and correct me if I'm wrong, that is not dealt with in the, uh, in the bill as written, and that will have to be dealt with in regulations. Well, well, it is, well, respectfully, it is dealt with in the bill. It says base rent means, and then it defines exactly what base rent is. It doesn't say base rent shall be determined under method two regulations by the department. So I just, I want to make sure that like we have all this, we are voting on a bill today that will have massive consequences, good and bad. Those we some support, those some we don't, those some we're finding middle ground on, which I appreciate. But I just, this in, in the amendment that council member Stewart had, it referenced the previous tenant. The current one added these two, and so I, I think we need to grapple with that. I'll give you a minute on that to, th to think about, because I have two other questions that I want to go through before we uh, address this. Um, the other one is just a clarification on concessions, and this deals with base rent two, because base rent means rent charge for a regulated unit under a lease exclusive of any rental discounts, incentives, concessions, or credits that are offered by the landlord, accepted by the tenant, and itemized in the lease separate from the rent. So I, I raise that just to make sure everybody understands, and this is discussed publicly, that that means if someone is signing a new lease and there is a one month free concession or a two months free, that the monthly rent number is the monthly number exclusive of that discount. It's not baking the discount in over the 12 month period, and then that is what continues if there's a tenant holding over, et cetera. So that's the base rent. So I just want that to be confirmed. That's correct. There were no amendments made to the base rent, so what's it introduced still remains the same. Agreed. Okay. So that that is good. I just want to make sure, because we, we got a number of last minute questions about that particular issue, both from tenants and from landlords, of what you know how that is going to be treated on their lease. Um, but the question of the vacant unit. If, 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 if a unit is vacant for one month or for 50 months, is, is it 50 months ago 
and is is then the banking at capped at the ten percent? I mean, because we, we we base it off of how long the previous tenant was in there, and the base rent, because now it's tied to the unit, not the tenant. And so I just before we pass the bill, I just think this needs to be clarified because it's not subject to, to regulation. Yeah, during the PHP committee back on June 26, that was the first time that the language had uh, was under consideration. My understanding from my notes, what I'm looking at is that uh, Mr. Councilmember Juando withdraw that motion to have the um, any rent increase following vacancy. So that language was not included for today. Then today, uh, Councilmember Stewart also had that under consideration, and that was not considered uh, today. My understanding that was also withdrawn. What was adopted and approved today was the amendment that if there's a lease signing or a lease renewal, that's when we're looking at the base rent, the CPI, whatever that is, along with the um, banked amount. There are no provisions concerning vacancy following, rent increases following a vacancy. There is a, a provision concerning the vacancy because the protection is for the unit, including a vacant unit. That's, that's, for, that's the reason why I'm in, raising in, the indirectly, question. Indirectly, yes. Indirectly, yes. The, the, the unit itself um, because of the provisions adopted today um, does provide some vacancy controls there, yes. That's so if a unit has been vacant for six months, for a year, for two years, the base rent would go back to whatever the last rent that was charged for that unit. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I, I just think it's important, and uh, th this isn't an area of disagreement necessarily, mm -hmm. it's just an area of clarification that is needed because you know we've been you know going on the fly here a little bit more than I'm personally comfortable with to be honest so please correct me if I'm wrong um, it would not be an issue for under a year because you're only allowed to increase it once every year the issue would come for a long-term vacancy uh, that there's, a, I, to, to me, I think there's a lack of clarity, and Ms. McCarty Reed can, can correct me on this, that if there is, say you had rented your home out, sorry, say you had rented any, any, anything, any unit out uh, for a number of years, and then for whatever reasons you decided to leave it vacant for several years, how do you determine the new rent when you rent to a new tenant. And that's where I don't have clarity. Um, and I don't, do, is there anything? Could I give another example? Because sure. So one example would be a, 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 a true vacancy where literally nobody is in a rental unit. Another example would be a, you know, somebody having a relative or somebody that they're charging below market or no rent to. Before that was not an issue because or a question because it wasn't for the unit, it was for the new tenant. But now there, there is a question about are, are, are we tying the previous, you know, that, you, know, you know, if there is no lease, let's say, it's, a, it's an agreement among people who know each other, family member. Sorry, could we just, could we solve this by adding to the section on the amendment another piece that says, for any unit vacated for more than a year, we will have method two regulations and deal with that under regulations, and then Director Bruton can address it. I hear what you're saying. Here, saying, yeah. I mean, like, and this is part of the issue with all these things. Like, there's all these different scenarios that could come up. But I think the issue comes up if the unit has been vacant for more than a year okay. is where this becomes more of an issue. And so instead of trying to do this now at 20 to 6 p.m. at night. Um, I agree. I just think it needs to be raised before we I, vote. I, I, just, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I believe that the annual rent increase allowance provision is annual so that if the unit is vacant for two years, I would assume that each year the increase is allowed, even though it's been vacant. But you know that may be something we need to clarify if there's any confusion about that. But it, I just will clarify: it's based on base rent, and base rent is defined. Right. So it's, it's, it's unless you want to send base rent to regulation, which would be the other 
option, base rent, I mean, just to, just to be very clear here, we are not voting on what people would like to do or what people intend to do. We are voting on legislative language in a bill that will have significant consequences in people's lives. So I just think we have to be precise. I'm just conferring with um, uh, Director Burton that the recommendation by Council Member Stewart is probably the, the best and probably safe way to, to go in terms of allowing the uh, department to look at vacancies um, after and to determine um, the base rent and what that uh, rent allowance should be. All right. Do you want to <laughs> say what that would be? And I'll, I'm happy to move it at the suggestion or second, you know, Council Member Stewart's Council Stewart, do you want to take a, you want to take a stab at that again? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, for vacancies over a year, however we are talking, DHCA or Director of DHCA will prepare Method 2 regulations to address that. What, what line? Could, could okay, you, so we would could be you amending, insert it into yeah, We have to, yeah, that's fine. again, I appreciate that we're trying to find a resolution. I thank you, Council Member Stewart, for coming in and uh, making a, a, a very constructive suggestion, but we need to find a line in a specific place and actual language to, to put it in. After line 93 would probably be the most appropriate place to put it. Um, and that section uh, just would talk about rent increases following a vacancy. Uh, and the subject to method two regulations, the uh, department would have uh, the authority to establish regulations for a tenancy that is um, that's vacated for more than a year. I just want to clarify, more than a year. Um, and that... I, I would frame it as no active lease for more than a year. No active lease. Because, okay. because that could be vacant, but it also could be released to a, a relative for below, mar you know, or some other standard that would cover a broader category. I, 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 I just, I want to clarify oh, with the, the two lawyers. Um, what qualifies as a tenancy because if you have uh, a relative in your basement and they're t you're taking money from them does that establish a tenancy it, it, there is some jurisdictions have the ability to establish a tenancy without a lease um, and i just don't know if it, that's true here that's fewer than two units would be exempt so you what situation you're referring to might be exempt the, yeah, if you're only renting, yeah, that does solve that one issue. All right. So a tenancy can exist without a lease. I think that should be important to know. State that again. A tenancy can exist without a lease, without a formal written lease. Right. Now, my only point is that that may have an impact on what happens here. If there is a tenancy, but it's not necessarily vacant, but it's not necessarily a lease in the marketplace, you know, that, that's a different standard. And so we can have both provisions, where there is a lease and where there's without a lease, and so that this would cover both scenarios. Um, so if a tenancy is either terminated and the property goes vacant, or if the tenancy is as a result of um, a written or oral communication lease, like that, that's also uh, parameters that we can include as well to cover all bases. Okay, I have one other question after this. <laughs> Clarification. Well, do we want to? Yeah, we have so to dispose of this issue, and I just right. want to note that. Did you second it? I'll second well, it. Do we want to reiterate what, what it is that Please. I just seconded? And, and I apologize, I'm not writing as I'm, as I'm speaking, and so if someone has been writing when I've been speaking, that's probably better. Um, but, uh, Subject to method two regulations, the director would be authorized to establish regulations um, concerning uh, rent increase following a tenant vacancy or in the circumstance of uh, a oral lease or um, a active lease that it's more than a year. Is that, does that get close to what you were referring to, Councilor? Where a unit hasn't been actively leased for over a year. For a unit than, hasn't been actively leased. Is that? Please, Council Member Stewart. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, uh, Council Member Drawney, you want to talk about this? No, okay. Uh, Council Member Mink, do you want to talk about this? Nope. Okay, uh, all those in favor of this amendment, raise their hand. 
That's unanimous. Okay. If I still have the floor, one last yeah. question. We a number of our affordable housing providers have asked for clarification from the department of how the department would now view the voluntary rent guidelines, because most of the agreements that the department has with affordable housing providers as a condition of receiving county funds for affordable housing projects, not exclusively because a lot of times it's a subordinate funding stream and, and the rental requirements are coming from the federal government or some other standard, not necessarily the county's voluntary rent guideline standard. But there are many circumstances in which the voluntary rent guidelines are used. The voluntary rent guidelines are probably going to be stricter than this in most years, but it will be different and it will be confusing and there could be two different standards within the same building. And so could you clarify that? I'm not proposing an amendment, but I think it's important. These are our most important partners that are providing affordable housing and there is some concern and consternation that they're there is going to be quite a bit of confusion with these two different standards. Sure. Um, I think the exemption, the existing exemption provision that states that um, units that are subject to an afford affordable housing regulatory agreement are exempt from rent stabilization. And so if uh, a unit has uh, a federal, say, Section 8, uh, state slash federal being LIHTC or, or some kind of bonds or local uh, HIP funding or AHEL funding or uh, the Nonprofit Preservation Fund funding, uh, then they would also be exempt. And so if they had a HIP loan that said rent increases can only uh, be done by the VRG annually, then that agreement with the government, that regulatory agreement would be what governs the increases for those units. So you don't think it's a conflict necessarily, but there would be different standards for different types of units? Yeah. I mean, for example, LIHTC, the, the LIHTC rent increases would be exempt from our rent stabilization. Um, the Section 8 rent increases are subject to their own rules. Sure. We can't control those, and we never have been able to control right. those. are controlled by a different level of government, and we are coming in as a subordinate dynamic. The concern that has been raised, I just want to note it for colleagues, and it might be something that we have to take up separately from this, is having multiple county standards, that you could fall into the voluntary rent guideline standard, you could fall into the uh, rent stabilization as part of this bill. There are, you know, plus all the federal standards and other standards, and so it, it is adding a, a layer and a level of complication and potential confusion. And so it begs the question of the role of the voluntary rent guidelines moving forward. It was put in place, you know, partially to set a standard, you know, that was voluntary for private landlords, but it was also has, you know, been used in order to be adopted for agreements with the department and there's a question of whether or not those agreements should be amended to follow the rent stabilization standard as approved here, number one, and number two, for moving forward when the department enters into agreements of using the rent stabilization standard, you know, and allowing that to be the standard as opposed to the, the voluntary rent guideline. So I, I just, I'm not proposing an amendment here, I'm not proposing anything specifically, but I think it's important because we've heard from multiple affordable housing providers about this question and this concern, and so I think it needed to be raised as we address it. I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. You can yield to other colleagues. Uh, very good. Thank you for raising uh, those questions. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Jawanda. Yes, I appreciate it. Just on that last one, I mean, we have we have many standards now, right? There's the VRGs. Then there's there's nothing for other. You know, you don't have to follow anything. So I think either way, communication is going to be important here. Um, and then obviously there's what our federal part, what's required of uh, through certain types of deals. Um, I, I, I did want to, my last point was based on what we already took off the table, so I don't need to say anything else at this point. Very good. Council Member Fani Gonzalez. The bill that we drafted exempt this type of pro properties already, and I have been discussing this with different uh, nonprofits that deal, deal with housing. Read online. Um, Page 7, line 12, 
um, a, un a unit subject to a regulatory agreement with a government agency that restricts occupancy of the unit to low and moderate income tenants. That's the MPDU program. It's exempt. So the voluntary guidelines actually still, I think they're still good, but I think we can, you can get back to us, but I already took care of here. So it's uh, page we will, the department will continue based on these contractual agreements to produce the voluntary rent guidelines each year because we're, we're, we're obliged to do so based on these existing contracts unless we and the other party wanted to renegotiate them at some point in the future. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, good. <laughs> Sorry, new system. You think I figured it out 11 hours into a meeting. <laughs> um, yeah, just to clarify, I was not questioning whether or not it was included in the bill. I know it's included in the bill. The question has been raised of what standard they would be held to based on which project. Is it the restricted units or, or not? I would suggest that you have conversations as part of your process, specifically with the affordable housing providers, because there are a lot of questions and there have been concerns raised about the uh, the different uh, standards and one of the dynamics of a lot of the affordable housing projects is not just about the regulated restricted units that are part of MPDU and otherwise it's the other units that subsidize mm -hmm. the market rate units that subsidize the affordable units in addition to the federal the county and the state funding that they receive and so they have raised concerns and questions about this in fact Councilmember Fani Gonzalez had you know, potential amendment addressing one of these dynamics that ultimately was withdrawn, but that spoke to the fact that the market rate units are subsidizing the affordable units. And so they've raised considerable concern about that, about the questions. And so I just, um, again, I'm not proposing an amendment here. I don't think there's a, an issue in the bill, but it's something that has been raised that should be addressed. And I don't know of a better opportunity to address it as part of this bill than now. So I'm suggesting that you uh, address it. And with that, I will uh, yield back to you, Mr. President. Okay, not seeing any other comments at this time, uh, not seeing any motions for any amendments or clarifying questions. Oh, I spoke too soon, Councilmember Jawando. No, just when appropriate, I just wanted to make a you know, motion. Uh, hold on, hold yes, on to I'll that. I'll wait for it. <laughs> hold on to that. Um, uh, I would like Ms. McCartney Green to do her best, and she has been doing her best all day long. Thank you. Pinch hitting today and hitting home runs throughout. So um, Ms. McCartney-Green, can you walk us through this amended bill? <laughs> and we can summarize at least the amendments from today. The amendments from today. And yep. so with the motion from the PHP committee, in addition to those amendments, um, and I don't have them bullet points, so I'll be flipping through pages, uh, but the first thing that the council did today was the transition language. Um, that would, the requirements of the act must not apply or must not be enforced until the method two regulations required under this act takes effect. Um, the council also approved today um, the to allow the director to establish in accordance with method two regulations or promulgate um, regulations to establish, set, or regulate fees that may be um, exorbitant fees or increases and uh, that either new or existing fees that are part of lease. In addition to that, there was a banking provision that we talked about, obviously, and uh, with that, the definition of banked amount uh, will be defined. Uh, concerning a dollar amount uh, for the rent increase allowance that a landlord did not use to increase rent for the regulated unit. In addition to being defining bank amount is a ge general provision uh, that says upon a lease renewal or a new signing of a, a lease agreement, a landlord must not increase the rent of a regulated rental unit to an amount greater than the base rent plus the rent increase allowance um, and any bank amount not to exceed 10%. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was um, an amendment to look at uh, subject to method two regulations as well. The director is authorized to establish regs for rent increases following a tenant vacancy, uh, whether that is no active lease or a unit um, that hasn't had an active lease for at least a year. Uh, in addition, there was uh, 
some uh, amendments concerning exemptions. Uh, one of them specifically was units that offered for rent for less than 23 years, um, and the unit has to be a newly constructed unit. Uh, there's an exemption that uh, for substantial renovation, which was introduced by Council Member Lukey, but had an amendment to instead of 25%, 40% of the assessed value. Uh, and then in addition to that, also gives the authority for the department to uh, establish method two regulations um, to look at substantial re rehabilitated building if the substantial rehabilitation occurred within uh, the prior 23 years and the billing is not in violations of Chapter 8, 26, or 29. Um, I think that's all that for the exemption on substantial uh, renovations. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, number nine on page 11, but there's an exemption also for natural person landlords. And uh, the council did amend the, uh, the original amendment where uh, a rental unit owned by a landlord who owns two or fewer units within a county and is either a natural person or a trust or a state of a decedent. Um, in addition to that, the council amended the title of the bill. Uh, the bill is no longer going to be referred to as the Landlord-Tenant Relations Anti-Rent Gouging Protection, but instead will be referred to as Rent Stabilization. Uh, the effective date of the bill will just default to what is typical, the 91 days. Um, so the provisions of six months will be uh, redacted or removed from the bill. Um, and lastly, council staff asks for the permission for technical amendments to make any clarifications or adjustments there. Thank Good you. job. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Ludke. This is this is the time before we vote, right? Right. All right. Anyone so has any closing on the same statements? Page. Yes. Um, so I know there's been a lot of passion brought to this entire process in in both bills that were originally introduced, and um, I you know no one up here wanted to see price gouging continue in any way, shape, or form, and that was why I was proud to sponsor um, this bill in its original format, but. And everybody continues to, to raise concerns about the rent being too high in its present state. And it's really important to note that the action that's taken here today will not decrease rents in any way. Um, it won't do that. Um, and we won't be creating more rental units because of the actions we take here today. In fact, we could be exacerbating the supply shortage problem that we have that's creating the base rents under the traditional supply and demand economics that, that is the fundamental aspect of, of the crisis we have here um, that makes the rents too high in the first place because we don't have other places for people to go. We don't have additional units online for people to choose to live. Um, Renovations, repairs, and substantial maintenance projects will end up getting avoided, which to me is not good consumer protection. It's not good for people. It's not good for public health. It's something that we heard time and time again at town hall meetings um, that was a big concern. And we know we have folks who can go out and do inspections and handle complaints, but, but we would prefer, everybody would prefer, greater habitability that was proactive rather than reactive to an inspection that comes after filing a complaint. Um, and buildings are going to get, rental buildings, they're going to get reappraised. Um, those reappraisals will decrease or flatten their values and that lowers the amount of property tax revenues that the county receives as a result. We got to know that. We have a finite amount of money to pay for different services and to do the things we seek to do, all of which are, are in the residents' best interest, but we can't do all the things if we can't fund them. Um, and I was consistent from the time before we were ever sworn in through now about wanting to prevent price gouging because consumer protection issues are near and dear to my heart and very important to me. Um, but because this bill goes much further than that and we will have to see the cascading impacts of it because they will exist, we just don't know precisely what they will be at this point. Um, and I have great concern that that will threaten the very housing affordability problem that we keep saying time and time again we want to solve. Um, and so for that reason and all the reasons I've given throughout the arguments and amendments here today, I will not be supporting this legislation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. 
Thank you. Um, I'll be brief because we've said a lot. Um, I, I'm very uh, pleased. I said from the beginning that we needed to pass meaningful protections. Uh, I think the bill, as amended, as outlined by Ms. McCartney Green, achieves and meets that bar. Um, it's not the bill I introduced with Councilmember Mink. It's not the bill that ultimately passed that Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez introduced with colleagues, but we got to a place. The legislative process produced uh, a compromise, and it's a compromise that will provide meaningful protection for our residents, for our 400,000 plus residents who are in rental housing. Um, we will change it over time. We will improve it. Uh, but this is a, a, a proud day uh, should we pass this, which I believe we will. Uh, and it's going to protect and put on par and provide stability for our residents. That's what they want. That's why they uh, get up every day, go to work. They want to know that they're going to be able to come home, keep their kids in their school, make sure that their health is, 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 is well. They go to uh, their local grocery market, all the things that develop in communities. Um, and that's why we named the bill the Home Act, because these are about keeping people in their homes. Um, and I'm very, very pleased uh, that we were able to work together. I want to thank each of my colleagues who contributed to this discussion. Um, what, what, regardless of what the final vote is, everyone on this dais contributed constructively uh, to the final product. Um, and I think this will be a historic day for not only Montgomery County, not only for Maryland, uh, but for the country. I think we will become one of the largest jurisdictions in the nation to permanently cap rents at a livable rate. Um, so I'm excited to have played a role and uh, thank all of my colleagues. Um, and with that, I would uh, like to move adoption of the final bill. Okay. As amended. No, well, he's, he's moving it. You're yeah, moving as it. As yes. amended. Not, yeah. not shutting off debate, but just. Uh, no, no that's right. Uh, Council Member Jawando, um, motion is to move the bill. Is there a second? I just want to move the bill. Um, uh, you want I a second? Uh, I guess I'll second. You'll second. That's fine. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Council Member Mink. I just wanted to. Um, Second, the appreciation for all, all of my colleagues, um, all the hard work that was done today and in advance of today. Um, I wanted to give a, a shout out to my staff, um, Anna and Frankie especially. Um, so many, so many bills read from all across the country. Um, so many conversations with, uh, with community members, with stakeholders, um, and not just as part of this office, um, but, but prior to their tenure here. So very lucky to have them. Um, and um, very grateful to everybody uh, who has weighed in on this process to help us, help bring us to this moment and make sure that everybody's voices were heard, that we knew what we needed to be thinking about, that we knew all the different pieces that we needed to be weighing. Um, so many, so many people brought so many different little pieces to each of these bills uh, to ensure that when we came together, we had thought about, I'm sure we didn't think about everything, but uh, we, we, we thought about a lot and, and I really just appreciate uh, the community engagement that has, that has gone into this, the stakeholder engagement that has gone into this. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, to, to our director, Mr. Bruton, um, you've been, your knowledge has been invaluable to really um, everybody in OLO has worked on so many different elements of this from the rent regulation report that we have constantly, constantly referenced while we've been up here and throughout this whole deliberation process to the different um, impact analyses. There has just been uh, a lot of effort that has been put into this really historic piece of legislation. And uh, I'm just feeling deeply, deeply grateful to be part of it in this moment. So thank you all. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. I uh, just want to remind everyone that I that I did not make opening remarks this morning. So <laughs> I do want to just uh, say a few things. And uh, I think that Councilmember Katz did jinx us when he made his 
quip about the sunset. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, for, sunset? <laughs> for us being here <laughs> for the sunset. Um, now, I, as mentioned early, very early this morning when we started the discussion, uh, it's important to note that we started this discussion months ago, six months ago, with every single member of the county council expressing an interest in uh, providing some level of rent stabilization. The debate has always been about what the most appropriate number might be. Uh, and I want to thank my colleagues for engaging and being willing to do the hard work necessary to find the right balance between the very real need of helping individual renters uh, while ensuring the very real need to increase uh, housing starts. The bill I originally signed um, uh, onto was directly focused uh, to prohibiting bad actors from raising rents to unreasonable, unsustainable levels. Uh, the bill that we're looking at right now um, is far from that original bill. Uh, while I understand that many renters are currently uh, considerably rent burdened, I believe this bill will make it worse. Throughout the public hearings, we heard a lot about conditions that were unsafe and untenable. Uh, this bill will not improve those conditions. We need to address that. Um, and I do think that uh, when we talk about bad actors, this bill could make that worse. Uh, we need more rental units, not less. Uh, the possibility still exists that this bill will reduce rental units. Um, one of the major determinants of housing cost, of course, is supply and demand. We know that our demand far exceeds our supply. It's incumbent on us uh, to do everything that we can to encourage construction of additional units. This legislation will stifle our ability to do that. We've heard a lot of rhetoric on all sides. We've seen studies and data on all sides. Uh, and we have had many passionate, passionate discussions over the past six months and over the past 11 hours um, today. Uh, as Councilmember Albernaz uh, mentioned very early on, I respect my colleagues for the votes that they will take today. And I understand the motivation of each and every one of us to serve the community. Uh, we're all smart people. We've all done our homework. We simply disagree. Uh, believe me, it would have been much easier for me to go along with the majority, but that's not my job. My job is to do what I think is best for Montgomery County. Um, while I've been committed to finding the right balance, I'm not willing to give in on the most important objective of increasing housing options. Uh, this bill does the opposite. Um, it's, it, it is not balanced, and I think it will do more harm, and so I cannot support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Um, before I call the roll, I once again want to thank Ms. McCartney Green for all of her work today, Mr. Bruton, uh, and Ms. Catrivanos, uh, and also Ms. Wellens uh, in absentia, who is not here. Uh, and so, with that, yes. One more compromise for today. I'd like to withdraw my motion so that it can be made by my colleague, and I'll second. So I withdraw the motion, if you okay. agree with it. Can we all go home now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to vote. <laughs> no before. Councilmember uh, Fanny Gonzalez. I move approval of Bill 1523, my first bill, which I have the great honor with joining with Councilmember Sidney Katz. Um, it was not, I, I did not want to work on this bill. Let me just say that again for like the first time. Uh, but I'm going to to have worked with each one of you, but I, I'm i pretty happy that I'm doing it with you, especially because you're term limited. So it's like my beginning, your last thing. Well, thank you. Is there a second? There you go. And with that, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Lukey? No. Councilmember Lukey votes no. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? No. Councilmember Albernaz votes no. Councilmember Duwando? Yes. Councilmember Duwando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? No. Councilmember Balcom votes no. Councilmember Friesen? No. Councilmember Friesen votes no. Councilmember Glass? Yes. 
Councilmember Glass votes yes. And with that, the bill is approved seven to four. We're adjourned. <laughs>